one, check two, one, three, two, three, three, four. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Check one, two. Check one, two, three, four, five, six. Check one, two. Another DB hey, or check two one, down, two. George. Check one, two, three, four, five, six. Check one, two, three, four, five, six. Check one, two, three, four, five, six from Washington, D.C. There we go. All right. Thank Check you one, very two. much, guys. We made it through. Bravo, everybody. Good yeah, job, that Mickey. was a quick one. And a, a huge of thank you to George job, for Mickey. providing those tickets to the summit. It was awesome to be able to be there. Thank you, George, and to your group. And I just wanted to thank everybody who's been putting questions in the incoming list for using comms and the colon for those for the second hour. We've had good action on that since the beginning, and that makes it a lot easier to figure out what goes in what order. So thank you. And if you haven't put questions in, still the best time of the day right before the show starts. I want and to then hear, please, everybody right. listening, vote them up and down. Vote the ones you want to have dealt with earliest and at most detail. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you are in YouTube and you're looking down, you can see a little, a little link down there. You can join us here in Zoom. Uh, if you are in Zoom and you're looking at this huge panel, we haven't had panel, a panel this big for a while. Uh, uh, if you'd like to figure out how you can become part of it, we would love to have you. We've got a lot of new faces that have been uh, jumping in recently, and we're really excited about uh, adding adding new knowledge, uh, new experiences to the panel. So um, so we're, uh, so if you want to be part of that, you just have to get here early. Uh, we open now. I say by six. I, I'm I'm starting to open earlier. I think today I I think we opened the doors at like five forty five forty five. But by six o'clock we'll be we we have it opened. Um, and then at six you don't have to be here that early. But at six forty you should be here if you want to be part of the panel. Um, between that, between six and 640, we're all over the place. We're just talking about whatever we feel like talking about while we're having coffee and tea. Uh, at 640 to 643, we do the um, mic checks. Once we've done the mic checks, that's the panel for the day. So um, so if, you, if you'd like to be part of the panel, be here by 640. Uh, we put out the Discord link. That's where over 800 of us keep talking. Uh, uh, we put that out at 643. Uh, it is, uh, the, you have, 30 minutes after that to, to join. So you should, uh, uh, you should jump on those links if you see them go by in Mukana. Um, and uh, then of course we, we get to the top of the hour, which is where we're at now. We, the first hour is general Q and A and the second hour is usually something specific. Uh, the first, the, the, the key is <clears throat> this show, sorry, I'm a little frog in my throat. This show is literally driven by the questions. It's driven by the audience. It's a different kind of show than you'll probably see any, almost anywhere else where, you know, there's not uh, any, there's no run of show. There's just questions. What are people going to, what are people working on? What are they challenged by? Are you, if you're trying to build a virtual event, if you're trying to do media production, you know, there's something new every day. And what you should do is write things down between the shows and then bring them to us. And then we can discuss them. Uh, as I've said before, this panel that you see here represents centuries of experience uh, of, of, of in many different areas, not just one, but many, many different backgrounds. And uh, it's, it's a really great uh, resource for all of us. And what makes it great is actually your questions uh, driving those conversations. So please ask the questions early, vote them up and down uh, as needed. And, uh, and we'll work our way through them today. Uh, we're going to be talking about comms in the second hour. So if you're going to ask questions about uh, comms, um, you know, walkie talkies and phones and ClearCom and, and Unity and whatever those questions are, put comms colon or com colon, and that'll tell Bill that we're going to get to those uh, in the second hour. Second hour tomorrow is going to be education. Every, every Saturday, we, our second hour is talking about how do we use this, this, these tools for education? Mondays are kind of a wild card. Tuesdays are audio, Wednesdays are video, and Thursdays tend to be more art and culture driven. So that's kind of our, um, that's kind of the flow that you can expect. And uh, if you are interested in uh, actually sharing this, the one thing to do is not share your own link. Uh, you, it's tempting to share your own link, but I, but the problem is, is that um, you know, everyone will come in as you. So use the link that we just posted down in Makana. Um, that's the best link for you to use to uh, share with others if you want them to join as well. Okay, Bill, let's uh, jump in. Oh, I have to, I have one quick question first. Chris, did you say that you have an EV RE20 or RE10? I was being silly. I have an uh, RE, my chain was an RE10 through a piece of string into a rain pseudo acoustic infector. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you don't have an RE10? No, not on me. I, I haven't seen one of those in the wild for a long time. I think I just only heard like this thing that registered in my head is like he has an the RE10 was my mic for a long time and I someone stole it. 
from my radio station and I haven't seen one since. So anyway, um, they're not, I don't think they make them anymore. Um, I don't think they do. We're gonna have to find you one though. I know, oh, man, I love that mic. Anyway, so uh, it was, it's, a, it's like a small version of the, uh, of the RA20. And, and for some reason, I, uh, I liked it a lot. Anyway, so um, Bill, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, get to the questions. Absolutely. Our first question comes in from James in Dublin. Yesterday, you touched on using the Facebook portal device to bump Zoom to 720. Does it matter which portals used? The 8-inch model is now available for only 64 British pounds, which I think is about 85 bucks US, with current Black Friday deals. Would this work? Guy? We're checking right now. I'm trying to work with uh, Ken in the chat right now. I've got the the portal right here. <laughs> so <laughs> if we want to circle back to this in just a minute, he's he's getting on and checking the stats. So I think we need to have more than say hi to everybody, Ken. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> it's kind of fun, but let's circle back to this in just a few minutes after okay. we get a few more people into test if 720p is kicking in. That sounds great. All right, thanks. Uh, perfect. Next question. All right, second. Let me. Oh, I can't move that one over. All right. Uh, we're moving on to James in Dublin again, who says, what's the maximum number of people in Zoom the Facebook portal can show in grid view? Does it vary by model? Is anyone using the portal enough to know? I don't know. No, a bunch of people want to jump in Ken's meeting real quick that are in the chat. Um, we could figure it out pretty quick. <laughs> the meeting ID is in the chat right now. So um, go for it and we'll see. We'll see okay. it in real time. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I, I'm going to guess 25. I'm going to guess the portal won't go to 49, but we'll, uh, we'll find out in just a minute. All right, next question. Well, this will definitely take up some time. What, is, what are the advantages of having aluminum foil in your video case? Aluminum <laughs> <laughs> foil in your video case. Go ahead, Mickey. And replenish your, home, replenish the supply some, in your uh, hat. Some crafty. Take home some crafty. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny if you brought a if you brought aluminum foil to your case with your, your case, and then someone just looks over and you're like wrapping up you're wrapping up some of the lasagna to to take it like, back. Really serious serious answer macaroni though. and cheese. <laughs> Ser serious answer though, like black wrap is technically aluminum foil, black so wrap. black wrap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, you, you can use so black wrap to flag out lights, flag out cameras as a gobo. A lot of uses for black wrap. There was there was a time when when we would need to uh, wrap cables. I was I, I once did I used to do events at a at a location that was right near a radio station or actually not it was a radio transceive tower, um, and so that it was like forty antennas that took went over Lookout Mountain in um, Denver, and it, that was where all the signals went up and then all the way, they went back down again and you literally could just pick up. FM stations on your uh, speaker wire. So I had a whole roll every time I went there of, of uh, aluminum that I would have to cover the whole back of my, my kit and everything else to, to uh, keep it from picking up radio stations. So, so there can't, you know, when you're too near, I'm sure that, you know, might've affected my DNA to be up there that often, but, but the, um, uh, but, but I, that was one reason that we've, we've used a, a lot of aluminum foil. Go ahead, uh, Courtney, and then Bill, and then Jeffrey, and then we'll move on. Yeah, it's, it has the advantage of being both reflective and opaque at the same time. Uh, so you can use it to flag people off like uh, uh, like Mickey said, or you can also use it as a reflector. If you wad it up and wrinkle it up yep. and then spread it out, it makes a nice soft reflector that you can yep. use as well. Okay, Bill. That was exactly where I was going. Courtney just hit it. So. Yep. Good. Uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, th that's the reason why I asked this question was because I, I knew about the reflector, but somebody was talking about how they're putting aluminum foil over heat registers because, you know, now that we're getting in the warmer months where people are, or colder months where, uh, where heat's uh, being turned on more, that people are using it as a way to reflect the sound of the, of the uh, heater coming straight into the microphone. And then uh, I started going down that rabbit hole a little bit last night to see what other things that that can be done. Yeah, what else? What else can you do with aluminum foil? Well, you can wrap it around or wrap it around antennas, mm -hmm. and uh, that's something I used to do is because I always tried to get uh, TV stations from Milwaukee, right. so I'd have these awesome <laughs> antennas in my room, uh, bouncing off of lakes and things like that. So you can do that. You can, uh, and there's there's also. Uh, other ways, uh, reflectors is the biggest thing, not only to reflect light onto a subject, but also to refract light away from a subject, like putting a little bit of aluminum foil on the side of a monitor or something like that. So 
a lot of lots of different things. So I didn't know if the, the panel yeah. actually had something like that in there. One of the things that we in a recent interview that our interview the the gaffer did, which I thought was great, is like a thicker piece of aluminum foil, and he just knocked a whole bunch of holes in it to make a gobo, and he just kind of ran them random and kind of crinkled it up and put it in front of the light that was lighting the backdrop behind the person we were interviewing. And it was amazing how it just created this nice modeled, you know, like you didn't notice it, like unless you knew it was there until he turned it off. And then suddenly everything looked very stark, you know, and it was just something about it that just kind of created a feel that was that, you know, I've seen before, but he did it really, really well. And it was just a piece of, it was just a piece of thick foil with some holes in it. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, you can look that up under the word cucoloris, and yeah. some people on sets call them cookies. Same thing as that kind of gobo. But it's, a lot of times when you get it, they're, they are, when we've used them in the past, they're like really put on the light and they're designed for the light and they attach to it. This was just like a piece of oil with a bunch of things cut, you know, holes cut in it. It was, just, it was amazing how, how uh, random that could be in it. Very effective. Go ahead, Courtney. And I've discovered there's a, a Reynolds, Reynolds wrap makes a nonstick a version of their aluminum foil and it's shiny on one side and it's dull or a matte type on the other side so you could use it as a hard or a soft reflector and you can also fashion it into a hat and uh, protect you from keeping your mind thoughts being intercepted by the CAA you know that works too uh, John, Jeff. I've seen um, Broadway shows they use a uh, little aluminum trays as they're setting up all the wireless mics, they drop each one in an aluminum tray so that they don't get interference as they're testing them all out in the monitor world. So as they're prepping everything, they can pull one out and it transmits and all the others are in these trays so they're not interfering. Oh, that's, it's that's also a nice storage that people can come grab their mics from them. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's, I've never heard of that before. That's great. Um, next question. Moving on to Paul Edison Lamb. Is it cool to drop in during the early part of the six o'clock hour to get a quick audio video ruthless review asking for myself, he says. Absolutely. Like that is part of the reason that we get up early and, and make that available is so that people can just kind of come in and say, hey, can you look at my, uh, Brian did that this morning, uh, you know, um, at, at 638 or something like that. And so, uh, so, the, but the six to six thirty is the best time to do that uh, Pacific Standard Time. And at six thirty eight, we were able to get through Brian, but I was worried that we were going to spend too much time, and then we'd run run into our startup. So, um, but uh, but definitely between six and six forty is is totally um, the time to do that. Uh, you're more than welcome. We could fill up the whole time if people want to come look at their kits. Uh, we're happy to do that. Yep, absolutely. Next question. Moving on to Roberto Barrow of Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania. Morning, Arl. Our church began live streaming our services at the start of the pandemic and continued to grow our system. We have two Piso, uh, PTZO optics cameras looking to get one more. What are your recommendations for a network switch with POE and a router to control the cameras via Wi-Fi? Silence. Jason's there. I go, oh, Jason, sorry, I didn't see that. It's a small, um, a little small one. I mean, go, you, you can't go wrong with ubiquity, in my humble opinion. Other than mm -hmm. that, I'm, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, as far as the router goes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mickey? Yeah, ubiquity, but uh, study the, the protocols that your equipment uses. Because like, if you need more granular control, especially like multicast, uh, go with the edge line of products instead of the unify line of products. That's good. Um, Stuart and then Brant. Just pointing out that there are a couple of different voltages for PoE, so do make sure that both pieces of equipment are using the same PoE protocol, and also make sure that it's got auto sensing turned on on the router, so that if you plug in something that is not PoE, it shuts off the power on that port. <laughs> Very important, uh, or or just make sure that you're smelling for smoke if uh, if you if you don't have that on, uh, Grant. I would just caution uh, trying to control over Wi-Fi. Um, just, be, just because uh, you get a little lag that could happen. And as you're doing, you're trying to do a smooth move or you're, you know, you think you're somewhere and then you're, you're not and it gets the control, it lags a little bit and then spins off somewhere else. So it's possible, but I, I would try to get a cable to it. Jeffrey and then Jeff. Uh, using PTZ optics cameras, I've uh, used Netgear uh, PoE routers in four and eight port uh, versions. I would, or I'm sorry, switches, and I highly recommend using a uh, using the switch and then getting a router separate from that, uh, so you can uh, so you can control things a little bit. Good, Jeff. 
Yeah, I would second Netgear or Cisco if they just need a basic switch with PoE. Um, the one question I would have is, are they doing uh, SDI, HDMI, or NDI? And if they're doing NDI, they probably need to be a little more careful if their data, their video data is coming along that uh, Ethernet line as well. Uh, next question, we're moving on to uh, Brian Anderson from the panel, and he says, I know the ATEM Mini can be can control the Blackmagic Pocket cinema cameras for shading and such. Does that control include triggering the camera to start and stop recording internally? Go ahead, Roscoe, and then Jason. Yes, absolutely. And, of course, on the ISO, it does record the four uh, separate um, recordings. That's great. Jason? Yeah, um, not only does it do that, I, I got the graphic here. Um, the newer, uh, the newer micro adapters will allow you to use something other than an ATEM switcher, which, as you can see here, you know you've got your your 4K going HDMI, and then your bi-directional uh, SDI going into uh, an ATEM Television Studio Pro. Um, that's HD. I'm using a 4K right now, and uh, hopefully those will be out soon. Yeah. Um, next question. Rachel Ann Clifton is in with the next one, and it's specifically for Alex Golner in the panel from for Alex Forty. Can you speak on lower thirds in the editorial teams that make the decisions as to what they read and how they'll appear? Thank you. Well, the copies are usually provided by somebody else, by the producer, the edit producer, and stuff like that. So we're not usually determined. We don't say whether to put uh, the person's job title and how much text to put in there. That's usually been arranged in advance because of um, that's just been arranged in terms of scripting and producing. Um, in terms of timing, that's the editor's choice. Um, so they don't choose the size of the, type, of the type usually because usually that's been certainly in TV and news and uh, packages and stuff like that where you've got something branded. Um, part of what you do when you design these lower thirds is to make not to provide too much choice for the editor uh, because you don't want the editor thinking about that. Uh, thinking about those different things. You want them to um, think about how long to show the title for so people can read it, interpret what it says, and then for it to go away. And that's the major choice. Sometimes you bring it up a little bit after the person's speaking, so you can start, you can take in the first sentence of what they're saying, and then what might come into your mind when you, after you see the person speak as well, well, who are you? And then below the lower third appears. And as we've been saying recently, the current thing in the UK or certainly in the BBC is to put the lower thirds kind of here. Uh, so even though they're called lower thirds or Astons because of the character generator that used to create them in the UK, um, they have them here because quite a lot of stuff is happening on the bottom of the screen quite a lot of the time. Um, certainly scrolling news information or when one pro TV program is put inside another, which is put inside another, you get that kind of that effect. Um, this there's space here for that kind of information who they are but if they happen to be looking this way and the framing is like this then sometimes the text would be roughly here and but that will be built into the actual design of the template and it will position it properly um, but yeah it is decision is about how when to bring it on and how, how long to have it on for and if we're talking about a documentary when to bring it back um, say, for example, if you've got an hour long documentary or longer you might want to bring it back after half an hour because you don't remember who the person is a couple of names for that you said it's asked is it aston yes an aston <laughs> yeah. well it well so in in the united states it can be a chiron same kind of thing chiron was kind of the early stage of what we so we'll, we'll, sometimes they'll call it a chiron graphic and then one of the things in events because chirons didn't really exist in events is font like just roll in the font you know and then uh so the font is the is the lower third and then the final one is a um strap uh, strap and that's a europe typically a european or english term for it in events not in broadcast but well, strap it, in, in in the uk also in events and also in tv they also say tummy tag it's the tag <laughs> the tag that appears tummy on their tag. tummy to say who oh they are God, that's way that cuter like tummy tag. <laughs> ah the english you know like in the, you know the, the the you know there's in, in the united states it's confidence monitors you know but in england in in in, in england it's comfort monitors you know everything you know, yeah. comfort monitor or like confidence comfort anyway so all right husband uh alex what are your key tools that you use to create your lower thirds i am using motion because um like my clients use final cut pro so uh recently uh 
there's a new beta features of um, After Effects and Premiere have just been introduced in the last few days, which add a bit more ability for their lower thirds done using via Premiere, After Effects and Premiere to be better as templates. So you have a little bit more of the kind of features you might be used to with creating lower thirds for um, Motion slash Final Cut Pro. But I use Motion and Final Cut Pro to, do, to make my lower thirds. Next question. Uh, our dear friend Beiju from uh, India says, thoughts on the updated Blackmagic Designs Microconverter 3G? Looks like some interesting updates. Uh, can you, uh, this, is this the one we were just talking about or is this an, a different converter? Uh, it's part of it. Like that's all three of the converters have been updated. So you have the bi-direction that was updated with the camera control. Mm -hmm. The STI to HDMI 3G has also been upgraded and it's added an option to have a LUT on the output, which I think they inherited from the Terran X mini converter where you can actually put a 3D LUT on it now for the output on oh. the HDMI out or on the HDI loop out as well. So that looks like a really nice, interesting way to convert a log image to reference anywhere on set. Well, and that, so it, it does more than that too. I mean, I mm -hmm. now that you're bringing that up, I, being able to put that log in also means that you know, we can, one of the problems that we get into is you, you, you have a log output. I want to record log, right. And I may want to record that on an external deck, not on the camera. And the issue you get into is I, so I want the pipeline to be running log. And then I just, but when I go into my switcher, I need that LUT to be applied, you know, to it. And so that's a really great, um, you know, a great solution is to be able to have a converter that will convert it for my live event. And I can have that LUT, but I can have, but I can still record everything in my external recorders in a log format. Um, now you can do that a little bit with the, you can dual link something like, so you can have a camera, for instance, uh, that has, so well, it depends on which camera you're using. So if you're using like the mini Ursa, the mini Ursa has a front SDI and a back SDI. And so you can have log going out of one of them and, 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 and a LUT being applied to the other. So you can kind of you know, play with those things, but being able to just have it come back and be able to run it in log and then be able to make that conversion when you need to is a, is very powerful. So, um, that's a, that's a pretty, uh, useful thing. Now, the other thing you're going to see there is a really interesting interaction that's going on between being able to use LUTs throughout the entire chain. And we're starting to see this kind of long-term connection with resolve. So, um, this is why we're going to be getting more as a group into resolve. One of the reasons is because, you're seeing now. So one of the things you can do is you can run a live feed. So you can feed something into the, um, you can feed into resolve a log signal from your camera. And then you can actually in, with resolve live on, you can build a look, you know, so you can have your lookup table that you can actually build in resolve with a live feed then save that out. And you can put it into one of these or put it into the camera, you know, so those are, there's a lot of really powerful interactions between the software and the hardware that are happening that you really can't do anywhere else. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, and if I'm reading the copy correctly, it will allow you to either embed the LUT or not embed the LUT. And yeah. to that end, as you were saying, you could go back to the switcher mm -hmm. while you're still recording an ISO in RAW, which is great. Yeah. Next question. Next question comes to us from the panel's Phil Langer in New York. Does anyone have a review of the currently available Q&A system for live events until Mukana is available? Can you explain that, Phil? Yeah, I, I, I need to do a, a nice, beautiful, interesting Q&A with voting for an event, and Mukana isn't available, I suppose, unless you tell me otherwise. It takes a little work for us to set it up right now, but you should probably contact me. I mean, okay. you know, like we can, for folks, it's it's hard for people to do multiple events with it. You know, like for people to, right. you know, do stuff with it. We're not set up for like self-run events. That's right. holding up us handing it out. Right. On an event by event basis, there's ways that we can we can manage okay. that. So if people are looking for an event, it just takes a little bit of us, a lift for Chris to, to set it up for it. And we're working through those processes, but we're not, right. not quite there yet. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, I don't know if, go ahead, George, and then Grant. So um, we've been, um, obviously we're looking at uh, Mukana down the road, but we've been using Slido mm -hmm. for events and that's pretty solid. And um, let me just give me one second on this because I think um, I, I really like the direction uh, Mukana is going in and, and Alex has got a big head start and a lot of folks out there because he's listening to us and listening to the people. One of the big mistakes they're making out there with 
all these other platforms and not listening to the folks that are actually using. Slido's got a little bit of, um, it's usable right now, but it's not, they're not going in a direction that's going to be useful for a lot of us. But to answer you, Phil, that's a good option that you could actually pay a one-time event and move on. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, um, I, I, we're use this, using Slido as well. I, I, I built a system, a text message system um, to start with so that people could sit back and just text and not have to sign into anything. Um, and that was good, but of course, voting and stuff was was not in there. Um, and so then we we doubled down. And the, the the good thing with Slido too is they have <laughs> they have education rates, which most of my clients are uh, medical institutions. And so my uh, nine year old son with his um, e uh, edu uh, email address was able to sign up for a for an education <laughs> account. <laughs> um, uh, uh, how do you? What do you for the to get the questions from text, how are you doing that? Uh, I was using uh, Twilio, just a um, API. And so then it was just a, a, a number that uh, I had a dedicated number. Um, that number would just uh, basically send a webhook. And so it would send it straight into to, um, my web server. And it just had a bunch of um, um, uh, attributes that were, yep. were, were in that and then I just Past that, that was it, and then I'd send. I could send back to them and say, "Thank you, we received your message, and you are seven seventh in the queue." Or you know, and so I had, I had some logic. Had some logic in there. I I did it also for a um, for a concert um, as I was going. We we're traveling with the acapella band. Um, we needed people to sign up to the newsletter, and so the easiest way was that we would just say, "Just type in your email address and and text it to this number." Right. Um, and, and then we had that automatically sign them into our uh, newsletter sign up. So it was, there's some cool things you can do and it's very, very cheap. Well, we've been looking at from a Q and a perspective of if people are listening on the radio, you know, could you set something up or watching TV? They're not connected to anything. I mean, obviously you can listen to this show in Mukana, but how do we inc include people, especially where I'm thinking about it is you're listening to a radio in Africa in the middle of nowhere in Kenya, how would you participate in that conversation? You know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and meaningfully, because you can get to, are they going to have a phone that can listen to something? Probably not. But are they going to be able to listen to the local radio station? Probably. You know, I mean, the radio in Africa, as an example, goes everywhere, you know, and it's well, just and a matter of partnering with the, with the radio stations. Well, and lots of those, lots of those services like Twilio have um, local numbers in, most yep. of the countries um and and the other cool thing about it is that you can reply you know and so obviously you know you can do replies um makana does that beautifully you can do replies and so you can have those questions done but doing it even with a text you can send a text back um yep. as a reply and right. you could do that um a week later if you wanted to because you still have their number yep yep absolutely go ahead uh, Stephen. Yeah, SMS is on even the most basic, you know, fifteen dollar phones now. So it works pretty well that yep. way. Yep, absolutely. Interesting. All right, next question. Uh, Mickey from the panel here is interested in um, he's specking out a new broadcast facility for video routers and wants to know if everybody on the panel would rather A, acquire a router that can support all studios at once, B, acquire multiple routers, one for each studio and keep all the studios isolated, or C, prefer a solution more complex as a mixture of both. I go ahead, Stuart. C. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, that... I'll, I'll just take a breath for a second. Um, you want basically anywhere there's a vision mixer, having a router nearby allows you to assign inputs to the vision mixer, especially on larger ones, without having to go and repatch and do that sort of stuff. It's so much better. But also within a facility, you want one router that will send between the studios so that you can connect them if you want. So you can, like, if you've got multiple studios that are working on one production, you can send footage across between them like having a green room and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, see. And one of the things that you'll get to is as you start to have multiple studios is the need for patch, pan you know, like a true patch panel, you know, you know so, uh, you know, what you want is what will extend the power of your router is having patches on the back that you can sit there and reroute everything literally manually. And that does two things. One is, is it lets you, you know, add inputs to what's, what's going on. It also gives you 
certainty. So you can have patch cables that have an SDI output, <laughs> you know, so you push it in to the patch and you can see what video is coming out of it. And that, that, that really makes a big difference when you get down the path, what you want to be able to do, what we work worry about when we build these is that in a worst case scenario, I could hard patch the entire show, you know, like I could get, you know, if my router went down, I could sit there and route, you know, with cabling. That's why when you, when you walk into a broadcast truck, those broadcast trucks have those huge patch panels even the new ones, you know, like, you know, have, you know, have a pat, have these huge patch panels because it allows you to, you know, there's a point in time, no matter how big your router is, you don't have enough IO and particularly you don't have enough outputs is what you run out of. You typically have enough inputs, you run out of outputs. And so the thing is, is that you, you can't design, you'll spend a lot of money trying to design a router system that's going to do everything that you ever wanted to do. So what you do is you, design a router system that will do most of what you want to do, but then you can manually repatch, you know, um, IO with these and the, the routers themselves, I mean, they add up, but like a 32 bit tree is like 1300 bucks. But what really costs a lot of money is all the little keys and the, and the cables are all like 30 bucks each, which isn't a big deal until you have, you know, you buy 300 of them and then it becomes, a, a you know, an, an expense. So, but, but the thing is, is that um, you, we stack those up. And now we can really redesign what that router is doing. We can magnify the, the uh, you know, the power of, of every router. Now, the, the hard part is for us for black, a lot of our stuff has been black magic. When we get into larger route, larger systems, we have to, the, the black magic's cap, if you're doing 4K at 40 by 40 is a big deal. You know, now we put in 72 by 72s, you can get the 288 by 140, I think 288 by one, the, um, so there's other bigger routers. When you go into 4K, which is we only build really for 4K at this point, or, or generally, uh, you have the Utah Scientific is is probably the next one up, which is but that's you know now, uh, you know it's sixty thousand dollars <laughs> you know for it, and then the next the next one up from there is the Ross um, series, which is starts at about 120. And so, um, and then you get into real routers, like, you know, the, the Grass Valley, route, you know, the uh, Imagine routers and that, that type of thing. So uh, these are massive, um, you know, uh, routers, but even they all crash. I've had a tr uh, what's now an Imagine router, 256 by 256 in a, in a uh, broadcast truck crash before an event. And we had to heart. And the reason that we were able to get the event done because we have patch panels <laughs> that's that's when i learned the power like you know like like you know and, and a really smart engineer someone going like this and and and, re, and, and repatching it with uh you know 45 minutes before a show they repatch the whole show um in in the truck and so that is the you know that's the, that's the power of that um go ahead jason and then Stuart. here's a fun question that never even occurred to me until this minute can you patch fiber yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's there's absolutely patch panels for fiber. You know, you can. Yeah, you know, it's it's all by hand. It's just you're just patching light. Good, Stuart. Just one word of caution on patch panels, uh, especially in facilities. Not so much in trucks, because when the truck goes out, an engineer generally goes with it. But in a facility, make sure that any place you've got a patch panel, you've got a lockable door or cover over, so people who shouldn't be fiddling can't because well, you'd be amazed you'd be amazed the problems that are caused by the wrong person getting in and changing something that they shouldn't mess with yeah. and well and the other thing is is that uh i use so this is a very this is not a popular solution but i used non-normal or unnormal patches so it means that if you pull out the patch nothing you get you get no signal so a normal patch is you pull out the patch and it it, it has a signal going through it. And if you add a patch, it takes that, it, it uh, replaces that signal with whatever you put in. I like non-normal because I put, have to put keys in all the way across these little U's, these loops. And I'll put all these loops in and I color code all my loops so that I can, I know what they all mean when I look at them. And the red ones are going out to the world. You know, so if I have, a, if I have red loops, it means that if I pull those loops out, the world, I, I literally am hard, you know, pulling out. And the reason you do that on a really high level event is that, Hey, you're doing rehearsals. And all I know, I just go over to this one section. I just pull these things out. And I know that there is no way to get out of the building. Like, you know, like there's, you know, the way we design it is there's no way to get out of the building. I can do all the rehearsals I want. I can do whatever I want internally. And I'm not going to, it's not going to go out to the sat truck or to the, to the, you know, um, to the fiber or to whatever else is there. And so 
but what I'm always terrified of with patch panels is someone pulling out a cable and getting an internal signal of something that isn't appropriate. I would rather it go black than to show something I'm not supposed to show, you know, in the kind of events that I work on. So, so it's, it's a more expensive and more lab, labor intensive way to go because it's, you got all these extra keys and everything else that you're putting in, but it, it looks really nice. <laughs> and it, and it, and it, and I'm very clear of what is getting routed and what isn't. Um, but it, it, it's worth it. I think go ahead, Courtney and then Chris. Uh, back to Mickey's question, I'd, I'd go B with independent routers in each studio because of security these days. A lot of times uh, uh, broadcast facilities will rent out one of their lesser studios just as a link for a TV show yeah. or something. And they don't want that uh, that signal accessible in the rest of the facilities. Then you can set up tie lines that, like Stuart said, are under lock and key in, in a closet you can lock between the studios with uh, tie lines between the routers. But uh, they'd be under lock and key control. But each studio then could have its own, you know, 40 yep. by or whatever. And to Courtney's point, yeah, I mean, a, a 40 by 40 in each one or, or a bigger, depending on how big the studios are, plus, a, uh, you know, plus a central router that is the the hub to all those things. Um, it definitely, yeah, I think, would be the, the way I would approach it. Um, the thing you have to think about that we think about also is ba primary backups. For larger studios that we have, we generally have two routers. You know, one is, and, and that hard patch lets us hard patch between them if we had to. So if one router goes bad, we could um, switch it. What's funny is, is that we've never actually had a black magic, knock on wood, never had a black magic router go down. We've definitely had bigger ones go down that are more expensive, as I, as I said earlier. So, um, so we don't think of anything as safe, you know, like, so we generally have backup, you know, most of our major systems have two switchers, two routers, patches that get between them, you know, to, uh, to protect us. Um, next question. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Chris. I was going to say, uh, Courtney's idea about security is a really good point. Um, I was negotiating with a certain South Bay fruit company recently, uh, back when we had offices, and they wanted to actually come and look at the physical layout of the building and say, are these rooms private if we put a person in there? Like, no, but there's no windows and things like that. So that's an interesting thing. Also, I was thinking it'd be really fun to do a, like a second hour story time, or maybe actually it'd be better to be first hour where we just tell nightmare stories from the past yeah. that we feel that now we can get away with saying. We should do a second hour of night of, of production. It should be nightmares. first hour actually. That's not do that right. on Chris, Christmas. Go ahead, yeah, Chris. Yes, but not on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it should be just it in the be, panel. That's why I say first hour. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the very first hour. The pre. I have some pre great show. ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, 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 we I like start Phil's that idea it. earlier of Tony the Tiger yeah. lighting, so everybody yeah, is backlit yeah. and you know, nobody can see who we are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, next question. Whoops. Now, next question is my mouse wasn't where it was supposed to be. Uh, recorded three clips yesterday, Jeff Francis on a Blackmagic Design Hyperdeck Studio Mini. All three play fine on Hyperdecks. First and third play fine in QuickTime, Final Cut Pro, and VLC. Second has sound but black picture. Any ideas? Note correction second is not fine on Hyperdeck, it is a static frame. So. Jeffrey, I need to jump. I need to jump in here really quick. Mickey just uh, texted me. He says he's having some difficulties, and he needs somebody else to do the switching. Stuart, so, are you able Stuart. to? Stuart, Stuart, we'll hand it off to Stuart. Hold on one second here. Yeah, give me a second. I'll leave it on uh, panelist okay. view for a second yep. while I rearrange my desktop. But yeah, I can take care of it for Mickey. Okay, great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so, uh, what, what, oh, so you had uh, Jeff? Do you want to explain this a little bit more? So I wasn't actually the person who hit record, but uh, I was handed the SD card in a panic because they went to play it back, took the SD card, put it in their Mac, and this first and third file show up fine. The second file does not play. It has sound, but no picture. So any other tools to recover this? Go ahead, Alex. I don't really have a recovery tool, but sometimes when I render stuff out, I it doesn't work in QuickTime Player 7, but works in QuickTime Player 10 or X. So um, you never know. Even from the same device, even from exported from the same app, in the third render suddenly does, it doesn't work in uh, all QuickTime Player 7, but works in 10. I probably isn't doesn't apply in this case. Uh, go ahead, Jason, and then Sky. 
depends on the urgency situation, but I'd be remiss if I didn't remind people that Drive Savers does excellent work on SD cards too. Well, they can, they can. He's got the data though. The Drive Savers won't. Yeah, be able the to, file is fine, but yeah, they they won't. They, they has the file. It's just that the Drive Savers won't know what to do with the file. They just give you the file. I've I've had them. They they do do a good job. They're five minutes from my house. So um, this guy, I uh, possibly copy it to a different drive so you have a backup and then change the dot mov or uh, to or or just try changing the extension on the back end see if it it wakes it up somehow go ahead brian and then Stuart. i had some files a few weeks ago that came out of filmic and out of uh keynote as video files and uh, none of the adobe software could open it ran it through shutter encoder and had it rewrap it and they were they were it salvaged it so try that go ahead Stuart. I would have a look at the size of the file and double check to make sure that it hasn't recorded a black frame for the entire file. You might have sound and no vision at all inside the file. Uh, and also check your hashtag or your hash count for that uh, to make sure the file is a uh, properly written file. The most common time that I've seen that is someone pops the SD card without hitting stop. And so it, it, it creates a, a file that is not complete. Um, you know, so that's a, and with those mini, if you're, you're talking about the mini hyperdeck. Yeah. Studio mini. So popping the, if you pop the, uh, if you pop out the, the card without hitting stop, it will not close the file. And I have never been able to recover a file that has been removed that way. The data is there. It's just that there's no way to get to the wrap, you know, get through the, because the, it's not, um, complete, uh, the, places where we've seen something where there's a write error and it it is there um i've opened it oddly enough in handbrake <laughs> so handbrake is an ffmpeg uh front end that tends to be like tank you know it just kind of reads a lot of anything that ffmpeg can read and so sometimes i've been able to i've actually as recently as last week corrected a file by throwing it through handbrake and having it just re rewrite it um, I will say that I've had issues recently with, with HyperDex not being able to play videos themselves. I haven't had them write them that way, but I've had the larger HyperDex. I wrote out a long QuickTime and put it on the HyperDex and it would play parts of it in long frames without, you know, there's a bug there somewhere, but I haven't been able to track, you know, track it down. So I don't know if that's related or not, but it's, it's happened to me and then it, you know, removed a night of my sleep. <laughs> so by, 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 by yeah. occurring, so. I've, I've salvaged audio files using Audacity's yeah. raw data import, but yeah. I'm looking for the same sort of tool for video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason and then Stuart. Uh, another app. First, Handbrake is a great solution because it understands uh, H.264 so well that even if it's prematurely terminated, there's a good shot you could get, you know, most of it out. These I would also say ProRes LT. Is, it's ProRes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So ProRes. Yeah. Okay. I, in this case, edit ready. I would try edit ready. That'd be another one or two. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Stuart. Just on dealing with corrupt files, uh, three solutions. The, the hammer of the gods solution is Gparted, which is a Linux based option to recover data. Uh, SanDisk actually have a piece of software that you get under license if you bought a SanDisk CF, CF card or SD card, whatever. You, there's normally instructions that come with it with a serial number that you use for that card where you can download the software and it can recover things from most SD cards. But the one that I've had the most res, uh, luck with, if you would say, um, is get back data from runtime software and it will recover nearly anything well, as and, long as there's no physical damage to a drive or a card right and physically i mean the issue is we, we have the file the file's not lost it's the fact that the file isn't playing back correctly is the challenge okay well jeff we would love a report <laughs> you find something you'll get it and if you're how big is the file do you know 28 gig Ooh, i mean if you 36 minutes yeah uh if um yeah it should be all there it's there somewhere um uh, but let's, uh, if, if you have, if it keeps failing, let me know. Cause I mean, I might be interested in looking at it. I I'm always worried about this stuff. So figuring it out now is useful for me. So, uh, you know, like I, I would like to figure it out now instead of in a rush. So, uh, if, if you don't find a solution by the end of the weekend, let me know. And maybe we can find a way for me to look at it. Okay. Thanks. Bullets are good. Yeah. Um, uh, next question.
And this one comes to us from Lucas Hardstogs in Maine, Germany, but I messed it up earlier. So thank you, Lucas, for reposting and getting it back in here and voting it up. An NGO wants to get statements from people through Zoom. What ways would you suggest to get a recording of those statements? Zoom internal recording or HDMI out in full screen to a recorder? Um, well, you definitely don't want to. I mean, Fen uh, yeah. Where's Fenwick? Is he, is he, you know, he's like, what, what, Jason? Go ahead. Well, um, Alex, I'll give you Alex's solution. Um, scrape the screen, scale to 105%, and ISO record. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. So what, uh, if you're capturing them remotely, there's double ending, which means you're recording on their end as well as your end. Um, you can scrape the screen. Uh, we, we would love for Zoom to give us a deck link output from, from the computer, but we don't have that right now. Um, a point-to-point -point business solution or a Zoom room is gonna give you 1080p out of the HDMI. And so that is number one. If you're gonna record it remotely from them, you want the 1080p output. And so it, you can't have anybody else in there. You can't have other people viewing it or other, other than that. So you, you know, it's, it's you, you, one, you on one side and them on the other and you do a, um, and if you want to copy yours, like screen scrape yours so you can put it into another Zoom, that's fine, but don't have five people join, you're going to get a lower resolution. And so, um, so it's a point to point connection. And then you do a screen scrape, you know, uh, uh, from there uh, of their of their screen. And again, the Zoom room is, in my opinion, the easiest one to do that with, because on the web, you can define what's going out of your, you might have a couple HDMI outs, and you just define this one is the other, right? And, and what's cool about it is if you want them to do a presentation, you can have their screen scrape is on this HDMI and they're on this HDMI and you can get both of them if their computer on their end is fast enough to serve up both of those at the same time. The, um, the, the other thing that's kind of the secret sauce is the Brio. Uh, you can use a huddle camera or Brio, but the, uh, the Brio is a little smaller and a little less expensive. The Brio, if you can get it is great because you can, um, you can pan and, uh, uh, you can do scan and pan in, inside. So you can zoom into them. You can move it around a little bit there. Oftentimes the far end is not going to be very good at that. So, um, so you want to kind of figure that out if you can. Uh, and those are the, those would be the big things as far as getting those. And then just make sure you get good audio. Uh, we, we found that most of our clients have kind of leaned into the, you know, that the, that a headset is acceptable. And so we put headsets on, there's a lot of different ways of miking people, but the problem is, is that getting them put it one, it's hard to get them to get the headset on, but once it's on, they don't make mistakes. They don't pull away from the mic. They don't go towards the mic. They don't, you know, they, there's, it gets rid of most of the things. And so it's, so we, we've moved pretty heavily to that because it just reduces a lot of other errors that they may make while they're being talked to. Go ahead, Grant. And then Brent. Uh, I just add that cloud recording is your friend. Um, so you, in the web settings, you can set that you get a separate file for a uh, gallery view and active speaker and then also screen share. And so um, when you record in the cloud, you get all those files and they're all in sync. So you can literally bring what those resolution? three files at the resolution that they are. So as in whatever the maximum they were, they were at, you will get, if you have 1080, you'll get 1080. Now, mm -hmm. I, often, more often than not, it's 720. Um, which seems to be the case, uh, which obviously is really nice. I mean, mm -hmm. 720 is fine and it's, and it, um, is completely clean because uh, you can choose whether you have the, the name turned on or not. And so even, even in the gallery view, it's a completely clean video of, of your gallery view with no names. Um, so then you can add your own, um, but it's, but it's completely in sync. And then you have an audio one as well. And then the extra trick on that is that you could also turn on, I've just been doing this lately. You can turn on, uh, allow local recording. So you're doing a cloud recording. And then you do a local recording on another computer that's not the host. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that in AWS in the cloud. Um, I, just, I just did a show last night. We had five breakout rooms. And so I ran five instances in the cloud and, and recorded, put each one of those rooms into one of the breakout rooms and then hit record. And what you can do locally then is you will get individual files, audio files for each person that speaks. So like stems. Um, and you'll also get whatever is being shown on that screen is a local recording. If you have a 720p view and you've pinned someone for the whole time, you get that. And so then I've also done it for multiple interviews and I want to pin individuals, then I'll get that ISO of that 
um, of that person talking, as well as I have the cloud recordings. Great. And so um, it's a great solution. You have all the files then. Great, great, Brett. Yeah, that's all great advice. I second all of that. Um, I was just going to mention that most of my clients are looking for specific frame rates and codecs to line up to their edit workflow. So the external screen scrape method is usually preferred so that we can specify the record codec and, and various timestamps and just saves a step in our delivery. Yep. Yeah. And we, I, I, before I start editing anything, it gets washed <laughs> in compressor typically, although we've had some issues with compressor re recently. So we're just trying to figure that out. But the, uh, um, but in general, we're, we, we do our, we convert everything to ProRes before we start cutting it. Um, you know, uh, Chris real quick and then Sky real, real fast. We're going to go into speed round. Understood. What's the issue you've had with compressor because it may have been fixed. Um, the issue that we've had with, we had some compressor wasn't closing the file. Like when we were converting stuff out, like it just huh. was like not like, like running for a while and then not working. And then the other thing was softness, which I think you saw. That's been fixed. Too. Has that been fixed? Okay, because that, that was softness fixed. was a big issue. It's fixed if you're using uh, the latest compressor and you're using Big Sur. The softness uh, on scaling has been fixed. Okay, because that was that, that was a big issue for us. Go ahead, Sky, real quick. Yes, Grant, you're saying that the the 1080 ISOs of all of videos as well as the audio. I mean, I've had the audios ISOed, but you're saying you can get five separate audio or video signals somehow. No, you get you get Active Speaker. Okay. And you get, and you get gallery view. Okay, got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question. We're going to go into speed round. I may not call on everybody. Uh, we're going to go through pretty fast. Go ahead. Next question. And for and all of you voting, this is when it matters. You see, if you vote the stuff up ahead of time, the ones that don't have as many votes don't get don't get as much time. So that's why it's important for you to vote those questions up. All right. Go ahead. Plus, I might have missed. I, I've been trying to do some uh, thing. And never mind. Uh, a Mitchell's in Washington says, Chris Russo, congrats on the next round of Frame IO community events. Curious about the change back to hop in. What made the better this that a better choice this time after the push seemed to be leaning towards the Zoom platform? And he's got a link there. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, the this is this will be the third framework event. Um, the the last one that A Mitchell's is referring to was it was more of a a quick put together, not not as produced, hop in, um, and we've looked at several platforms. Hop in uh, allows us to take an RTMP feed in to deliver a more produced event and uh, also familiarity. And it also lets us uh, keep the uh, the social hour and the external, you know, the after presentation events in the same platform. Um, I would really like to to go to Mukana um, eventually, um, just because the limitations on on Hopin or many of these platforms is the upvoting questions and not having uh, separate separate chat. Um, so, yeah, we're back to Hopin to to deliver and produce uh, have a more produced event. And we're close. We're we're just trying to get stuff where people can self self manage their projects, and so we're we're getting close. Um, so we'll let you guys know. All right, uh, ne next question. Next question is actually George S. of St. Louis, Missouri, but I just wanted to, to roll back on the stuff that we held about the Zoom uh, portal. I've got those kind of clogging up my system. So do we want to run back and take care of any of that with... Um, what's the... What's the, what's the right? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and push that question in real quick. Um, and then let me push this picture I just took. So I logged the portal into um, this meeting. And we had like almost 30 panelists, I think. And you could see down in the bottom corner that even though there's 30 people there, it only shows 50, uh, 25. No, 25 times four, 20. Yep. So 25. there's the answer to that I think, one. I think it's five. I see five by five. Five, one, two, three, four, five times four, right? Or one, no, two, three, four. Oh, no, no it's 25. 25. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Very good. There is a second math. page with that little right arrow over there. Right, but it's just that it was, yeah. it's how many will show at one time. Looks like 25 is the number. And then I guess the other question would be about hooking up an HDMI to it to get another another yeah. view. I think you can go gallery and gallery so you get 50. Yep, that's great. Um, did, we, did we decide that it does give you 720 if, if the little one jumps in? So I, I'm guessing because it's the same software that I'm, I'm almost positive it would work because mm -hmm. the hardware, it's, it's, you know, just the gut. So I'm, I'm guessing it's going to work. 
And the thing so to know is that, of course, Zoom eventually is going to give us 720 across the board and then 1080 across the board. It's just been them slowly building up that back end. So we're in this weird moment. So really investing a lot of time and energy around 720 and 1080 is a it's good for the short term if you're doing jobs, but it's not something I would think about like what you're going to do in the tail end of 2021. My guess is by the middle of next year, it'll all be 1080. Um, next question. And James had a follow-up to that that was also highly rated. What is the maximum number of people in Zoom the Facebook portal can show in the grid view? Does it that vary the, by model? That was the 25. That was the 25. That was okay. So we got yeah. that taken yeah. care of. We got that taken care of. We got that taken care of. And now I can move on to George S. in St. Louis, Missouri. I need software recommendations to retrieve vintage DV video for import into DaVinci Resolve 17, the free public beta. The signal path is a Canon Optura XI camcorder to a 27-inch 5K iMac on Mojave via Firewire cable to Thunderbolt Firewire adapter. QuickTime and iMovie both failing badly, and he is budget restricted. Any ideas? Stuart? Well, if you've already got Resolve 17 there, just capture and Resolve. Like, skip QuickTime and iMovie well, completely can, and make sure. But that is assuming. Yeah, and that's the adapter, making sure. Yep. Because if the adapter is not passing the frames through properly, that could cause issues as well. But yeah, just go straight into Resolve. So the two the two things I would try is I would try uh, downloading a demo of Cat DV. Cat DV is kind of built for that, and so I would take I would download that and, and see if that if that works. If it doesn't work, you're, it's not going to work on that machine. And what you should look at is investing in a small machine that's really old. You probably find an old machine for a couple hundred bucks or a hundred dollars or something like that that you can use that still has FireWire on it, and plug it in with an old operating system and pull that stuff off. I mean, I think that if if Cat DV can't do it, you won't be able to do it on that machine. You'll need to find older older hardware. Um, so that's uh, that's my two cents. Uh, we're going to keep moving. Uh, we're going to speed round. Uh, next question. Uh, Jason Bates from the panel. I'm looking for thoughts on a somewhat inexpensive rolling rack unit. Amazon has a Samson SRK 8R rack unit for $159. Is that too good to be true? Go ahead, John. I, I switched to Gator. Like this one back here is an 8U Gator and it's got wheels on it and a handle. And But it's, it's way more expensive than that. But I'm really happy with these. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jason. Yeah, most of my gear is Gator. Um, my my mixer, like all all of the stuff that I've bought that's that's rolling or otherwise has been Gator. And then I saw this on Amazon and I thought, wow, really? Okay, do I need to be spending four hundred bucks? Maybe I do. I just thought the panel might have some input. So, can you show it full screen? I don't I don't see it. Uh, uh, see. yeah, give me a second here. I could put the link. It's probably easier if I just put the link in uh, in the oh, chat. Yeah. So we'll, we'll move on, but we'll take a look at it. I, I bought one for like one hundred fifty nine dollars. That was <laughs> that was like twenty U, and the whole thing until you put stuff in it, the whole thing goes like this. And so yeah, see, uh, that's what I'm so worried as soon as about. You, as soon, well, as soon as you get everything in it, you you it kind of stiffens. The problem is is that there's little things about cases. Well, someone put in the second hour cases for a second hour. We should talk about cases for a second hour because. Uh, there's a lot of us that have strong opinions about cases and then we'll, we'll keep the rest of this for that because I have a lot of strong opinions about cases. Anyway, um, uh, next, I know you never think that I'd be opinionated about it, but, but I think a good, a good solid uh, conversation about cases would be good. All right. Next question. Mark Harder says, y'all keep saying screen scrape. Can you give some examples of how you do this? Use a camera at the screen, not a separate monitor output to a recorder. Yeah, it's a separate monitor output to a recorder, is a screen scrape. So when we say screen scrape, it means that we're taking an HDMI out of your computer, we're putting it into something that can record it, and we're just recording the screen, as opposed to a SDI output, like you're pushing it out of a deck link or you know, something like that, where you say, this output goes out to that. Um, it is just literally grabbing the screen uh, to do that. Uh, next question. We're running I think you time. can also do it by just a screen cap on your computer, but yes. Uh, but typically when we say, now I will say that typically screen scrape though is when we say it or when I say it, I mean, there's an external recorder and then I do screen capture is how I would define a capturing the screen. And the problem with screen captures are that they lower the, that they are attacks on the CPU so that if you're doing anything that requires a lot of playback, video, good high, you know, actual video or anything that's, you know, that you want to look good, the screen's capture oftentimes will impact that while the screen scrape won't anyway next question i'm doing that right now by the way 
Yep. Yep. Next question. Tim Holm of San Lorenzo says, I need to bring in two to three guests virtually into our live church service. He's doing it through IMAG, but the, or, uh, that's a projection, but the PA audio is obviously in a feedback loop when testing. How can I get the audio and video back and forth and have a good in-house and stream experience for the virtual people? Your people are virtual. We use OBS and can send separate aux feeds. The, yeah, the problem is not the aux feeds, it's the, it's the PA. And so the easiest way to do that is to give someone an SM58 on stage. So a handheld mic with a lot of off-axis rejection is probably not going to hear very much from your PA. You may still have to pay attention to it, and they can't pull away from it, or you'll have, when you gain up, you'll, you'll get them. Um, the next step from there is hand feeder. You, know, you, can, you, can, you go up and down as they talk. Um, that is a, a very manual and painful way to do it, but can be done. Then after that, you're talking about um, gating or, or attenuation where you have something ducking. So you have auto ducking where one, when the mic goes up, the, it pushes the other one down, vice versa. And then the way we do it is typically using a Dugan auto mix where it softly pushes one down when the other one's going and it, and it just kind of pushes back and forth. That takes some tuning. Um, go ahead, Jason, and then Jeff. Then we'll move on. The dumbest possible solution is to be sh like move your PA forward and be sure the mic's behind it. But you still, in, in that case, you'll you'll still want something a handheld mic with off-axis rejection. Oh you yeah, no do doubt, no lab. doubt. Yep, Jeff. Uh, I'm assuming these guests are not local, so they need to be on headphones wherever they are, so they yep. do not have open speakers feeding back into their mics. Yeah, great, uh, Grant, and then we'll move on. Just uh, mix minus as well. They may not have. They may not have we done say that. that yeah. And so, yep. mix yeah, mix minus. Is super <laughs> Super important is, yeah. is, is McLean's. Yeah. yeah, I was I was dealing with the harder problems of the thing, but yeah, making sure that you only send back to them. You, you, mix minus is you have a separate bus that is everything but them. You know, so you have the all the, everything's up and then and then they're down in that in that second bus. Um, uh, next question. Ivan Obigozo of Mercer Island says, uh, "Is there a Windows alternative to Playback Pro for media playback?" Uh, go ahead, Jason, and then Stuart. VLC, I think, is, is your best bet. Uh, yep. I don't know enough about. I mean, there's definitely PC uh, things that will play back. Um, uh, but, but VLC, I think, is something. I, I'm trying to think of what else. I think, yeah, I don't know of any affordable ones. Um, Pro Presenter. Oh, yeah. Pro Presenter. Or pre is it Presenter Pro or Pro Presenter? Is it Pro Presenter, right? Pro Presenter is absolutely a great PC um, tool to do it. It's PC and Mac. It'll do key fill out. It's got a ton of features you may or may not need, but it, it will, it, it's a very, very solid uh, play out. That's great. Great suggestion, Grant. Um, next question. Uh, TJ Asher from the panel. I watched a video from the Mercedes AMG F Formula One team and the video was horrible. It was all echoey from the room. Is there anything that can be done in post to fix an echoey room audio issue? The video in question, he has a link to it. Go ahead, Stuart. Yes, you can fix that sort of audio in post, but don't because it'll introduce a whole heap of artifacts into it and you'll end up with muddy sounding audio. Mm -hmm. It's better to have a lapel mic in the first place and do it right. Uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, I watched that video. It sounded like they did all they could just to correct the problem. Uh, so yeah, the lavalier mic, getting something closer, not using the phone mic, all that other stuff. The the one that I've used that I've, when I've had to do it and they may have already done a pass on it, it it's not a miracle uh, uh, piece of software, but Xenaptics Unveil. And uh, that that has, I've used that to pull out a remarkable amount of room noise, you know, out of, out of, out of a system in post. Uh, it takes a fair bit of time to process, um, but you can have it analyze the room and then, um, and then pull out a lot of those bits and pieces. Um, uh, next question. We're kind of in speed round here. Yeah, Stuart Fairweather from the panel. Bluetooth 5.0, is it new hardware or the uh, or on the PC laptop? Is it just firmware or driver update to enable it? Jeffrey? Uh, I use uh, Bluetooth 5 all the time. It's It's been around for uh, close to a year now, and it, it works well with the Wi-Fi 6. You can get cards, and in some laptops, you can actually change out your, car, your Bluetooth card and your Wi-Fi card to get to right. Wi-Fi 6 I... and Bluetooth 5. Very good. Uh, next question. Brant Kruger of Minneapolis, Minnesota says, um, curious what folks plan F is for streaming events. Had a solution or situation where the RTMP links on the platform were all dead day of show. And we were this close to moving the whole smash over to Vimeo. 
So read that again. Uh, curious what folks plan F is for a streaming events. I had a situation where the RTMP links on the platform were all dead on the day of show. And we were this close to moving the whole smash over to Vimeo. I think it would just depend on what killed those, those um, streams, you know, what killed those RTMPs. Um, I don't quite have enough information because the, 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 what it work, what makes it work and not work is the, different on every platform. So uh, go ahead, Stuart. Plan F uh, would be record locally and upload upload later. I know it's not the same as doing a live stream, but at least you get your content out there. Yeah, the one thing I will say is that is that I rarely will. I may delay something by a little bit, but if I'm having trouble with a stream, I will rarely rarely tell the talent that I'm doing. I'll tell the the client and the producer that we're having that, but I'll rarely tell the talent and the people there, and we'll just run it and record. You know, and because the problem is is that when you create stress for the talent, it just blows the whole show. And now you've, you spent all this money and time prepping everybody and getting everybody ready to go. Now uh, you're better off just running the show and recording it to, to, to Stuart's perspective uh, or, 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 or comment than delaying it, unless you think that you can really solve it quickly. Um, you know, but if you're in a really dead area, now the other thing is, is that, that this, what you're talking about is why we tend to start our RTMP an hour well we test it the whole day like we will run all day we will oftentimes let it run all night we will then get up and start it over again in the morning like as soon as our encoding engineers walk in they're they're hitting the rtmp they're hitting whatever their ingest is all the time because we're constantly afraid that something like what you're talking about is happening and so we want as much ramp up most of the time we're streaming to the ingest point at least 30 minutes before and for something like youtube an hour before um, because we can send to the same ingest, have an unlisted event and just watch it. Um, but we want to watch for any, what we would call, uh, you know, internet storms, you know, that are happening. Um, and we've had those. We've had right before our event, we've had incredible problems. But yeah, definitely knowing other ways out to your point, uh, to Vimeo or live stream makes sense. Go ahead, George, real quick. No, everyone. Um, I think Alex covered most of it. I am, I'm, even if I have 45 minutes before show, I'm, I'm pumping bars to that whole to make sure everything is still good. And, Once and I what, we, what we try to do is pump our program out if we can, you know, to, to something because we want to see audio, we want to see video, we want to see sync, we want to see, you know, there's a whole bunch of, you know, we want to see as much of the real life. And if you can send it out to a private, you know, thing with the same ingest point, it's really powerful. Um, you know, in the white or the clear listed systems that we use where we control the window. Like, so if you're, let's say you're going out to Akamai and you have a player and it's on a web page and the page is activated or our app is activated, we're running the whole time. And then right before that window opens, we're, we're putting in the, the start slate, but we're running tests and everything up right up until the last minute. We just make sure that they're appropriate. So if something turns on, we can get out of it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Sky. I'm just proud that he had a plan F. I think that's brilliant to begin with. B, that uh, this happened at our church. So we did, did a live record because mm. that was the only way to get it out of the building. We did not get the same response. That particular service didn't see the numbers when we did present it live in the middle of the afternoon. And the, the third thing, is Vimeo now doing a live stream opportunity? They bought Vimeo bought live stream. So yes, they're doing They're doing the live stream. Yeah, the, the Vimeo bought live stream. And so it's probably the best like cheap way to not cheap but relatively inexpensive way to own really own your player uh and they have a ton of great i when they bought it i thought they were nuts but they've done a great job they have their own um channel system you can have them build your a, a channel that will run on apple tv and everything else and so there's a bunch of things that that are there that, that they've a bunch of services for corporate and organizations that that's pretty pretty good their back end is not the best in the business, but it's it's fine. Well, um, isn't anything better than YouTube Studio, really? YouTube Studio is a dumpster fire. The actual platform it sits on is probably the best public CDN out there. Um, next question. And the final one for the pre-grouping, uh, Darren McMahon of Rio de Janeiro says, as, as inadvisable as it may be, is anyone using vMix on a boot camp Mac, in my case, 32 bit RAM in uh, 32 gigabit RAM Intel UHD 360 graphic system, what will be my limits? Go ahead, uh, Stuart, real quick, and then we're gonna move on. Even on PC, Intel graphics is your limit, just to avoid it you're probably better off spending some money on a cheap secondhand PC with a decent NVIDIA graphics card and like let it take care of your H.264 encoding. Yep. I agree. 
All right, shifting gears. A little late, sorry about that. Um, uh, but uh, we are shifting gears to comms. And one of the reasons that we uh, are talking about comms, and a lot, it's been coming up quite a few times in our, in our little chats, and I thought it would be worth a second hour to, to discuss it. Uh, comms, we're going to define as pretty much anything that is a back channel for your event. So if you're working on an event and you, you, know, you need to talk to the crew, you need to talk to each other. And, and in virtual events, this has become more acute. You can't just run over and talk to someone at their table. How are you going to communicate with them? And what are those pipelines going to look like? And, and I'll argue that comms is half your show. You know, and you know, that is really like how you communicate with people is, you know, we build very com complex comms and especially on virtual events. How do you communicate with the host? How do you communicate with the, with the guests? How do you communicate with the producers, especially in, in a virtual environment? You know, being able to talk to them changes the entire event. Like just being able to have open communications and you're talking and you're going back and forth and you're communicating and all those things. Um, you know, and when you don't have comms work well, it really comes apart. And the first, and I'll say from the beginning, my, my early comms were texts, you know, like, why? And there's like a text back and forth. And then it grew to phone calls. Um, and then, you know, so then the phone call next, and then we had walkie talkies and then we had local analog comms and then we uh, got IP comms, you know, and then we have this mixture of IP comms and Dante and everything else. And so ours became, have become very complex, but we've kind of gone and almost everybody goes through the same, <laughs> the same thing, unless you work, start working on a truck. Um, and then even, you know, and, and, but I think that the understanding is still pretty backwards in a lot of places. You know, we work with broadcast trucks and they have a lot of great comms internally. And then they're like, can we call you on a phone to tie you in? And it's, it's a bummer. So we thought we would, uh, there's a lot of questions about it. So I think that instead of jumping into too much overview, uh, we're going to go through the questions to make sure we get to them. Um, so uh, go ahead, Bill. What, what questions we have? The first one comes from James in Dublin, and he asks, please explain the difference between an in-ear monitor and something like Apple's AirPods. Note in this instance, only the talent needs audio. Well, you can definitely use, an in-ear monitor is sending that signal to someone's ear. You can use an Apple AirPod to do that. Uh, you know, so it's not that you can't use that for in-ear. The and, and anyone raise your hand if you want to add to this. But but you know, an inner monitor is just whatever's in your ear that's going to let us talk to you. Um, I have an inner monitor right now that is not that. That this is a audio implements um, earpiece. Audio implements makes probably most of the in-ear monitors used in the United States broadcast. <laughs> so so they're they're kind of the standard uh, um, uh, company to to to, to build these. And you can get these for broadcasters that do it all the time. They actually have a little mold of their ear and it, they, they come with this piece. You'll see these, uh, this piece here um, is uh, pops off. So this is the, this is actually the speaker that, and, and when we do it, when we're, when we know someone's coming to put this part on, we just put this in our ear and we can actually, you can actually just put that little speaker in your and you can hear someone talking and that way we're not putting their earpiece into our ear. Um, but the, uh, uh, this piece though, oftentimes broadcasters will have, they have their own, um, you know, and, and so it just interfaces and then you just, you just pop it on. Um, and so, but we keep these, you know, here. And um, anyway, so in-ear is a, is a system in which you have either wireless or wired. Mine today is wired. Um, and, uh, and then you can go to the, the next level up from these is using something like a Phonak. Phonak is a ear, they make um, hearing aids, but they also make the tiny little ear in ears that have little in that it's not actually an antenna. I was told it's not, an, I thought it was an antenna, but it's actually just something you pull it out of your ear. So it's a tiny little bud that will go into your ear. You've probably seen it on 24. It doesn't work nearly as well as 24. He runs all over Los Angeles with an earpiece that seems to be wireless. It works for about a hundred feet, you know, like maybe, you know, and so, uh, but um, it, it, it's, it's a really, really nice uh, one. It's, a lot of more money. Um, it's like two thousand dollars a unit to 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 get it to work. So um, so anyway, it is. Uh, but you can. We've used them for you know talent. Uh, Bill. Yeah, I, I so I used to use. I had a, on set when I was doing ear prompting. Uh, one that you had to wear a collar, literally that, yeah. that put out a you little. Still get those. Feet. Auto makes those, and you can buy them on B and H for for a couple hundred dollars. It, 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 so it's got a wired thing, and it goes around your goes under your shirt as a little wired uh, inducer. And then it transmits to the, that way it, it only has to transmit a very short distance, uh, but it yeah. does leave you without this little coil um, for the in-ear. But anything and, you use is in-ear. The, the key is having it kind of low profile. Go ahead, Bill. 
Yeah, this is the the in air that I usually use on the air. I did a thing with mm -hmm. it that I shouldn't have, and I have to get it replaced. And they're going to send me a new one. <laughs> you but watched it, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, That's well, funny. not quite, but close right. to that. But you can see how small these are. I mean, the, the literally the wires are unbelievably small, so it becomes a very unseen as opposed to what I'm doing now, which is a, right. just a stereo earbud that right. you can see this honking wire out. So the, the technology is moving on. Go ahead, Sky. If you do have a client that has a Phonak ear, uh, hearing aid system with that little radio device, it is a Bluetooth and that's currently how we're, I've got a client that uses that every day and it's uh, pretty magical. Yeah, yeah. The, um, uh, the thing to know when we get back to comms is really deciding who has access to that in-ear, super important. Like, so it's not, you don't, want to give everybody or even there are very many people access you'll see someone every once in a while you'll see a host talk and suddenly they just pause in the middle of it that's someone talking in their ear when they're <laughs> when they're not supposed to you know and so uh now some people you can talk into their ear i, I imagine you know a, mo a lot of these really high-end hosts uh you can talk into their ear while they're talking it won't you know they'll uh they they can keep talking uh but uh, for the most part, you have to be very, very careful about when you talk to your host. And generally it's when someone else is talking, not when they're talking, uh, and, uh, and, and, and really know what you're going to say to them when you say it. Like one of the big things in comms in general is not to be, uh, wandering around in your, in what you're saying, when you get on, know what you're going to say, say it and then get off, you know, and, and not you're, you're using up a channel that everyone else is listening to. Go ahead, Courtney. Sorry, the black helicopters are overhead. I got to get my tinfoil hat out. Um, the uh, the Phonak uh, solution we used to use it a lot on exercise shows where they're wearing spandex or something. You can't even put the body pack or the yep. neck loop on them, and you actually build an inductive coil around the stage of the area they're performing in, which is about twenty or thirty loops of just lamp cord, and you plug that into about a, a thousand watt amplifier, <laughs> and and you drive it and everybody within that loop hears whatever you're piping through the comms yeah. in the little wireless earpiece and you don't have any wires or be belt packs or body packs to, to conceal. That's why they're sweating. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Well, the, the stagehands can't have children after that, but whatever. Uh, it's, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot my other point. I was uh, something right. about, eh, I'll have to come back with it if I remember. Next, next question. Okay, next question. We'll move on. Uh, Mark Helper of Brooklyn says, so Unity comms, I use this on site. Does somebody actually bring a Mac mini there and a set up a wireless network? How difficult is it and how reticent are local IT departments about letting one in, uh, letting one use their existing Wi-Fi setups? What equipment do you bring to give to clients to monitor? So, I mean, on site, I think that Unity comms can be a little difficult. Uh, they, they will work. I mean, they just work on Wi-Fi. I don't think you really, you usually don't need IT to do much of anything for the, to, to, for the Unity comms to work. The fundamental problem that Unity comms has when distributing these out is the fact that uh, wireless and Wi-Fi don't go together really well. And so you just end up with a lot of breakup, you know, like I, a lot of breakup and failed calls and failed uh, systems. Uh, and, and that's a really in, indicative of, of Unity is this dependency on Wi-Fi is something that I was just using it yesterday. It's not a great experience. And so, um, and so the, uh, when we go on site, the thing to think about is who needs to be wired and who needs to, who can be wireless. So um, just keep in mind that most of these devices, even your iPhones and iPods can be wired to an ethernet cable. You can do a lightning to USB, USB to light uh, to ethernet. You connect those together. You might have to put power into one of those. And now you can put your little panel is now wired. Um, and so now you can have a wired connection. Then Unity will work a lot more effectively than it, than it does there. It's still a little wonky, but um, uh, it, it, it'll work. The next level up from that, by the way, if you have an IT department or if you have, if you can, if, if you have something, if you have access to Dante, let's say you're doing something in an entertainment location is the studio technologies uh, have Dante belt packs. And you can just tie those together with your mixer. And now you have crystal clear sound and, and PLs and everything else. And they have a, we just got some, what are, I think there are 374s or something, 374As, which is like four channels of PL. And you're able to define that all in your Dante network. And so for local stuff, it, once you use that, it 
really hard to go back to, um, you know, something else. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah, I, I'm using uh, Unity um, Cloud, and I find that um, when, I'm, when I'm doing these virtual events, we have all the production crew all around the world, um, that uh, I tend to put my phone um, back to 4G or 5G I've got here. And so uh, I do that because it, it just relieves the network. It's, I can have my phone on 4G, and it works perfectly. Um, so uh, that, that's um, uh, separate to the question. The, and so what I'm saying there is that Unity Cloud is actually a really great option, although it is feature limited. And so th there is quite a few cool features that Unity has that are not included in the cloud. Um, and so I'm actually, I was just talking to Tucker yesterday and he's, um, uh, and he's going to hook me up. So, uh, we're going to, he, so he, he's sort of rolling his own <laughs> unity cloud in a way. So he's one of us. So, um, that's a good way to do it. And I would, so I would prefer to ha even have full blown unity in the cloud and not bring it on site. Right. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, uh John. We're also customers of Tucker and the, the greatest thing about Tucker is your service comes with Tucker and yeah. he's always on a back channel. The only problem that we had with Unity uh, is when we were testing is we had to adjust the buffering time appropriately to smooth out some of the signal. And then once we got it dialed in, it worked. And most of most of my crew uh, were running Unity on the desktop. I think it. I think it actually runs better. It's a better experience on the desktop than it is on the on the iOS devices. At least, uh, it's just more stable. Go ahead, uh, Sky. Somebody should describe what a Tucker is. <laughs> Tucker is he's he's been too busy to join us. He's er, a, a, an early member and a longtime member of our little group here, and he is the secret weapon when it comes to doing uh, Unity, you know, um, uh, uh, work. So uh, he's got quite a setup and. If you uh, if you are trying to do something large or global or or even something that you need, and the great thing is again, you basically are bringing an intercom engineer who knows how to do this stuff. So you're not just saying, "Oh, I want to get Unity." You just have someone who's going to set it all up for you, be all there, you know, be there and be able to change things as needed, and you give them exactly what you need, and it just all goes away. And and that there's a level of service there that is 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 pretty valuable. I think his so. his last name is pronounced Drago. Is that correct? Drago. Dragoo. Thank you. Tucker I mispronounced Dragoo. it again. Yep. And you can find him on, on, uh, in our discord. Go ahead, Grant. Yeah. Just, just further to that. Um, I was saying before about how I spun up some instances, um, on AWS to have zoom breakout rooms running. Um, and actually this was Tucker's idea when I was talking about using breakout rooms for stages. Um, he then took that to the next level and, uh, has these breakout rooms running so you had like six breakout rooms running in AWS, so individually logged into those breakout rooms. And then using VB cable, he's doing um, output the audio from that Zoom room into Unity. So running Unity, the, the, um, the app um, on that instance, and then the audio back, going back into the breakout room from Unity. So what you end up with is your Break, all of your breakout rooms are sitting in Unity, which means you can monitor them all. So I had this working perfectly yesterday. I was listening to a breakout room just by hitting the listen channel in Unity. Um, and then you can have it so that you can talk into that breakout room if you need to assist them. Um, obviously, you need to think about that you going to program in that instance. But if it's a breakout, essentially a workshop, it's no big deal. It's just like the technician talking from the back of the room. But it, but it works amazingly well. So you could just sit there and monitor each room by the channel. And this gets back into the importance of comes when you start thinking about like it's, it's uh, being able to having the ability, especially in a virtual event, to be able to get to where you need to get to from a keypad, whether it's an iPad or a panel or whatever. It's super important to have those tools so that you can communicate with people and actually get the stuff kind of, uh, you know, tied, tied back in. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Um, I, I was going to, just so I understood that, um, it, it really is just like, you can just click across your breakout rooms. You don't even have to mm -hmm. be in the breakout rooms. Is, is right. that right, Grant? 
Yeah, exactly. You're sitting on your phone and you've got five breakout rooms, five buttons. You just can listen to them all. You can listen to yeah, one. Yeah, that's or... awesome. Brett, that's pretty cool. Brett, did you have a comment, Brett? I was just going back to the question that the, you know, IT departments are usually uh, very accepting of it, but we, we, you know, the port forwarding for external users. So bringing the server on site to accommodate external users, that's, that's the prickliest part of taking a server on site. So oftentimes right. we'll leave the server back at our facility and uh, feed audio channels back to it as needed, but it's just so much easier to leave the server off premises and avoid all that port forwarding with the local IT department. Yes. And anytime you're going to go to a major facility, whether it's an education department or a corporate, a good conversation with your IT department, they're managing a lot of other things and you're one little blip in that. And so working with them to make sure that they're happy about what you're doing and that they're ready to and supportive is, is super useful, um, you know, to, to kind of moving that uh, down the path. Uh, a lot of times we bring cellular backups. It's not a great a great solution, but we'll bring something where if we can't get connected at a corporate or a large scale, we have some, uh, not bonded, but just a, a good internet. But a lot of times we'll have different SIMs that we use to do that so that we fi figure out which one is the, the fastest um, and we use it if, if we get into a bind so that there's not, you know, that gets into the, we were talking about uh, what's your F plan or whatever. My, my plan, I think of it as pace. No, I didn't create that. It's a military term, but it's primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. You know your your pace plan. You know you know out of out of everything. And generally, most of our team can tell you what pace is for different things. You know this is what we'll do if this is what we're planning to do. This is what we'll do if that doesn't work. This is what we'll do if that doesn't work. And you you want to think through those things. And and so when I say I have a cellular, it doesn't mean that's what I'm going to use as my primary, but that's like contingency. You know, and then emergency is mostly text and phone. <laughs> you know, so, so that's the uh, that's what you want to kind of think through. Next question. Uh, and I remember what I was going to say. Just if you want a fun early days look at comms and how important they are to a show, broadcast news. It's thirty year old movie, but it's fun to watch. And they have a great scene with um, William Hurt and uh, Holly Hunter talking during a show live to the air and about how comms are so critical to things One working well. One of the, 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 we did one open, we were allowed to do it once and where we gave you, where was two times we've done it. Once was truly the start of the show and one was a made up one because we used the first one as the, to sell the second one. So the first one we did, we just opened up the comms 20 minutes before and we, now we told everyone like best behavior because comms are not known for being clean. And so uh, it's not really, you know, people are upset, you know, there's something going wrong. And, and, and so you have to be like, okay, everybody, hey, this is going to go out to everyone. So and and uh, so we as the pre-show, they just got to listen to the, the comms go on because it is magical. Like when you're in a back, if you're ever in a show and you can put it on and open up the comms, you just listen to this this incredible like I, I don't, that's when you really get how powerful they are. You know, there is all these different lanes. There's the production talking about one thing and then there's there's cameras talking about another and there's all, all this stuff going on. These giant events don't get done without that. You know, like they don't get done without that huge uh, orchestra of comms that are pulling it together. And, you know, there's usually someone that is managing those comms on site to make sure that everyone has all the channels that they need and all the little bits and pieces. And so there's this huge thing that happened on a big event. When you have like a, a Salesforce Dreamforce event where there's 15,000 people walking in, there are, you know, 300 people making that happen in the back end that are, that are all talking to each other. And some of them are on direct comms. And then some of them are on walkie talkies. If they're wandering around, walkie talkies become another piece of that. Although, you know, what happens is you use, you use walkies until you get the comms up and then you're using oftentimes a free speak system or, or a Bolero system to make that work. But, and the walkie talkies give you more control because on a, like on a free speak, you've got four channels on a, on a walkie talkie, you might have 10 or 12. And what's amazing to watch is someone who does concerts You'll be talking to them and they can, they'll just reach down and they'll count the number of clicks. They know what channel they're on and then how many clicks it is to get, they'll be on channel three. They'll click over, they usually go click, click, click. And they'll go, they'll be on channel seven and they'll just start talking. They're not asking. They're just like, you know, and they'll just click back and click in. And, and so, um, so, you know, walkies, especially for concerts on things that are temporarily set up is re are really popular. But anyway, so we let people listen to it and it was really, I mean, people just went crazy. The social, all the stuff is like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever heard. I mean, we think of it as nothing, but they just thought it was the coolest thing. And then what we did is we actually created a script for it where we, um, so the second time we did it, we played it out 
So you hear all the stuff. We made it all up, and but it was all perfect. You know, it was like oh, this perfect little like back. But it, it showed little things, and it showed funny things. Like we had, the, we made it look like the camera had been turned on accidentally from a wide shot of the stage. And so then we had it. We had someone run out on stage, like they're working on it. Goes, hey, can we get that guy off the stage? I mean, the the guy, you know, like we're about to start the show, and he's there's someone up there like messing around with the, you know, and, and then he runs off, you know, and, and someone runs out and gets him. And so it's but so it looked like we were, you know, making a mistake, and it was all part of the show you know, and so you can incorporate it, but it's a, it's a really fun, you know, comms are a really, you know, that communication and that ability to get to people is, is, is really powerful. Anyway, next question. Uh, Philip Tesoro of Brisbane, Australia says, what's the intro price minimum spend for using unity as comms? Uh, it's not that very, it's not very much. Go ahead, uh, George. So it depends on the cloud definitely is your best friend for entry. So, you know, I think I pay like $100 for five folks for seven days. So that's your entry level. And mm. then it could go up to thousands of dollars. Yeah. And you look at something like, I mean, I would, I would recommend in Discord to talk to someone like Tucker Dragu. If you're going to do an event, if you're doing an event, like if you're building a system, build your own system. If you're going to do an event, get somebody who's done this before to do it. The amount of time you'll spend <laughs> trying to get this to work uh, will not pay off uh, generally. So um, uh, you know, I would learn how that works and be part of that before I, before I built one, but yeah, I don't, I think a hundred dollars gets you 10 licenses. Is that right, George? Basic server or was it a hundred basic server? This is just the cloud version. So you're just buying for, for, for your show, the hundred dollars gets you with five, five to 10 folks. Oh, it's five. Yeah. Brent. Well, yeah. So $20, uh, $20 per month for three users is where it starts Okay. for the cloud. Yeah. And then the, uh, and know that you can use, a, you know, a, 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 everyone calling in on a, on a bridge. I mean, that's the least expensive way to do something is everyone calls in on a bridge, but everyone's on the same, you know, on the same dial in, you know, to make that work. Um, and so that's a, you know, but, but, uh, that's something to, to look at there. And then, you know, the, uh, you know, the next step up from there is, uh, we've been looking at, um, Oh, my, my brain is going to turn off here. Uh, Telos has their own kind of uh, centerless, if you want panels. The big thing for me is that when you, anybody who's used panels, you, you know, it's good to use your little phone and your iPad and your, your thing, but a panel is a panel. Like there's, 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 you know, you have lots of controls to it and things that, you know, for fine, you know, so, so Telos has kind of a centerless panel that you can, you can use there. And then from there, uh, you know, we use ClearCom. So we have a ClearCom Eclipse that is got hard panels inside of our facility. And then we connect people using Agent IC. Agent IC is a slightly a, a different version of, of, uh, of what you would see in Unity, but it's just for the phones. And then we have hard panels. We literally drop hard panels at people's houses if, we, if they're going to be doing this often because they're more stable than the phones are. And they are, you know, creature comfort. You can actually, you know, there's a lot. It's not more than just, yes, you can use a stream deck, but there's a lot more to a panel than a stream, than, than a button. You know, there's, there's us being able to control our volumes and we mix and match all those volumes and we're doing that in on the fly and we're able to, you know, latch things. And, and, in a, in a, when you're really working at it, it, it becomes, it becomes useful. Um, the next one, RTS is mostly used by people who use, who used to work in trucks. I was going to say, I'm, I know that sounds brutal, but uh, if you see an RTS system outside of a truck, you're like, wow, whoever designed this used to work in a truck because no one else, no one else I know uses them anymore. So, um, you know, uh, so, uh, and then there's uh, Riedel and Riedel is kind of the very high end, very expensive. And you need an engineer every time you want to change a button. Like it's, you know, it, it is, it's, it's a really nice system, but it's a, it's a big, it's a, it's a heavy system and you need to have, you know, we have a guy at our uh, events named Chopper. Someday we'll try to get Chopper on here and have him talk about comms. But Chopper manages all the every every event that we've seen in San Francisco and some in LA. If you're doing a Riedel system, Chopper is on, on on there, you know, putting it all together. And there's no way to run it without him. So it's a really it's a really hard system to run. Um, but it's it's powerful. It's clean. Go ahead, Jason, and then Courtney. Yeah, I bet Chopper's a busy guy. Um, so am I understanding this correctly about Telos? So th are you using Telos in addition to Dante and interfacing between the two? Yeah, so we're, um, Telos, we're, go we're ahead. testing it. We're, we're not testing it. We're discussing it with them, and we're researching it right now. It's brand new. Or, or not brand new, but it's been there for a while. They, they, 
are moving into that area. Telus is moving in there because they already have all this radio stuff, all the radio talk back and all the phones and everything else. They already had all the stuff and they were like, well, maybe people don't want to have a centerless, a centered system. Um, they just want everything to interface with each other. And they already had all the tech. So they're, we're researching it right now as far as a, just knowing that it's available. Um, and then, uh, but again, we've been using ClearCom for a decade. So we're, we're still pretty wedded into that, you know, the end of that process um, because it's really stable and really well-known and, and it's easy for us to tie into things. And we do really complex comms. And so I, 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 we think that we could do it in some of the other ones, but we just haven't had the time to figure it out. Go ahead, Courtney. I'm familiar with ClearCom, but on, on Unity, does it send, can you control multiple channels on the client side on their phone so that you can put program audio and PL uh, in two different ears, uh, for example, if you have a stereo headset or if you have a mono headset, can you mix the level independently of the two for the people that have to hear program audio in addition to comms, PL comms? I do believe you can do that. Go ahead, Brett. Yeah, so the one uh, thing on Unity is that there's not individual volume control over each channel. There is a program inject control on the back end, which works great. And you can actually have selectable audio paths there as well to IFBs and other things. But um, that's one big differentiating factor between Agent IC and, and Unity experiences is the individual level control from each channel. And that may seem like a minor thing, but when you're dealing with, you know, when you've got uh, you know, 12 point to points and six PLs that you're talking to deciding who you're listening to is really important because you don't want to necessarily turn it off. Like if I've got a production pipe, I may want to hear what's going on. So I'll turn that way down. I just hear it and I can listen for it. If I hear it, if I hear it chattering, I'll listen, I'll listen to see what they're saying, but the person I'm talking to directly, I want that to be a much louder signal and being able to uh, differentiate those is important. And then you can, you, even with agent IC, you can't really, you can't pan in stereo with agent IC. You have to, it's all mono. That is it's one thing on unity though. Sorry to interrupt. You can actually split on the program uh, and pan as far right. as that. That's the one thing you've got panning control over in unity. Yeah. Yeah. So that does help your brain uh, compartmentalize, you know, what's oh, yeah. going out versus what shouldn't be said aloud. You know? Yeah. We've, we've, we've made the request and the, the issue has been mostly just, it, it adds a channel usage to the system that that is a you know that we want anyway i go ahead grant that stereo uh comms thing is an interesting thing in virtual and zoom um talking to tucker about that as well in that you you can you can do it as a little tricky to to send um uh, talk back on one side mm -hmm. um so panned left for example and then you're pulling their program back um, out of the right hand side, which means that you can send that to everyone in that meeting. Um, and now you're only ever pulling program out of one side and you're always sending, um, your talk back down another side. So that, that way you can, you can, uh, have your comm set up in the cloud, for example, um, and not be pushing that back to program. And we generally are pretty careful about the, I mean, the <laughs> comms inside of zoom is super, uh, you know, you're, you're really living on the edge, you know, like you just got to remember that, you know, the, the thing that you worry about the most with comms is that somehow comms will leak back into the show, you know, like, like you just, you know, so as, as we build ours, for instance, that we have the clear comm actually feeds our zooms so that all of our show happens up here. And then it, when we're talking to them, it's all happening only to between us and the zoom participants that, that, that are in point to points, because that way there's no way for the, for us to talk onto a comm and have it show up. Go ahead, Brett. I was just going to go back to Courtney's uh, comment there. Uh, one thing that we lean on a lot is the ducking functionality in Unity as far as the priority channel. So you can actually set an offset right. for a priority channel. And that that's not having individual level control is definitely an issue for me personally. But that's one thing to help that is to right. uh, get that ducking behavior set up with both program and the priority channel functionality. No, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. And, and just to kind of uh, define for people who are listening, the difference, you know, some of the things that we're talking about here, I realize we're stepping over is one of the things we'll say is PL or party line. A party line is a group line that everybody is, is listening to at this. You, you add people to that group. So it's like a little room uh, across the comms. Everybody hears what everybody else says in that PL point to point is a, I'm only talking to Grant. You know, like I can, you know, so, so a lot of times you build lots of things like I will have a PL that is everybody. And then we'll have a PL that's just our team. And then we might even give a PL that's just the uh, just our client has their own little channel that they can they can talk to. Then 
cameras will have, you know, the TD and the cameras might be on their own PL. The audio oftentimes will be on its own PL. So we build these, there's a different group. All these groups have their own. If you, if you put them all into the same conversation, it would be a cacophony of everyone talking and be just insane, right? So by having, by breaking these out into channels and you'll break those out into channels on your, on your walkie talkie, if you're using a walkie talkie. But in this case, if you're, if you're doing this, you're, um, you're breaking it out into the groups that need to talk to each other with a couple shared ones. And then for every person's panel, whether it's their unity panel or whether it's their agent IC or their, a true panel or a belt pack, you're deciding who gets what, you know, this person needs to talk to these things. They don't need to listen or talk to the other people. And so you have to kind of figure that out. You, this is sometimes for a big show for us, it might be three or four days of planning <laughs> of who's going to be where. And it's in spreadsheets of this person has, you know, it's this person and these are all the, PLs and these are all the point to points and then they get to see it and they go, oh, I really want to talk to this person. And then we have to argue with them. No, you, you shouldn't talk to that person. And, you know, and so the, so there's a whole bunch of back and forth that you get into that um, of, of, of what those look like. And then there's also what comms you have when. So for instance, when you're loading in, you want walkie talkies, even if you're going to build a big comm system, you need walkie talkies when you show up. Otherwise you can't figure out where, what people you're running back and forth all the time. And just literally, I mean, we use Motorola, uh, you know, uh, pretty hardcore walkie talkies, which are, you know, have a really good distance, but you know, you can use, you can buy ones that are relatively, um, relatively inexpensive. The big thing is, is knowing whether they're like a, um, whether they're, I can't think of the, the GSM versus the, the kind of the radio, the frequency radio ones, there's a delay. And so when you click on it, you have to know that you're going to, you have to wait for a second before you start talking or no one hears the first word. I um, hate that so, so much. Yeah. You just got to get used to it, but it's, it is a thing, but, but the raw radio, little cheap radio ones actually work better in a lot of ways to, to do that. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. And in fact, having walkie talkies and good ones have saved my tail end so many times because we've sent somebody out to Home Depot to get a, you know, set of wing nuts or something like that that was desperate and found out that and with a really good walkie talkie system, sometimes we can talk to them and get them to add to the order and things like oh, that. Yeah. It's just a different world. <laughs> the, 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 the bow fangs are not necessarily legal, but they will go like eight miles, you know, like <laughs> You know, like, like we, we had them and we, we, I wouldn't recommend using them in the United States or get you in trouble. Uh, but, but the, uh, but that you can buy them on Amazon and they go a long way. Go ahead, Stuart. Just one note on walkie talkies, especially the ones you buy from electronic stores and what have you don't put any critical information over it because it's public. Everybody yeah. can hear it unless you've yeah. got proper ones that are licensed and from yeah, and a proper get- supplier. Yep. You can get licensed ones. And, and a lot of times if you rent walkie talkies from a rental house, you know, you can ask for licensed ones and those are going to be, and know that also when you work on a large event, you're going to deal with a, um, you know, a frequency coordinator. A frequency coordinator is a person who is going to manage everybody's frequencies, all their mics, all their comms, their Wi-Fi, the everything. That person is, they will tell you what frequencies you're allowed to be in, get out of those frequencies, and they will come talk to you in minutes if, they, if, they're, if they're good at what they do. Um, Sky. I wanted to have you talked about IFB as we're defining terms and well, that's about a little bit that. earlier. IFB and inner monitor is kind of the interchangeable. Okay. You know, Thank you. Yep. Um, Courtney and then Paul. Yeah. I was just going to go over a typical walkie talkie protocol on the, on set is usually they'll have a channel one will be production. Channel two will be a private conversation line. Then each department will have their own channel electrics on one channel you know, cameras on another channel, sounds on another channel. So everybody usually monitors one during the production, and if there's something private, uh, you know, once once the shot is set up and everything, uh, you know, as long as you're not coordinating, you know, during the setup phase, once you start shooting, everybody monitors the production channel. If you need to say something to somebody, you tell them to go to channel two, and you have your private conversation on channel two so it doesn't tie up production, where it, it carries all the cues like, you know, stand by, we're rolling, we're going to go live, or whatever. Uh, the the important information that everybody has to hear is usually on a, a single channel, and any superfluous conversations are moved to a second or tertiary channel for private back and forth. So you're switching all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 again, if you get up there, so and the general protocol on most of these is if I'm going to ask, uh, I'll I, there's a couple different ways of doing it, but I will go Alex for Courtney, 
And then, you know, I'll Alex for Courtney before I start talking, you know, so that he knows who I'm talking to. And then Courtney will say, go, you know, go for Courtney. But go to two. Yeah. 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 Or go to two. But, 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 but if, if I'm on the same one, I will almost always. And then if I'm on, if I have point to points, I'll say, you know, uh, uh, Alex for Courtney on direct. That means that he may not know on his panel what that meant. Uh, you know, whether I was doing it in the group chat or whether I'm doing it in my direct point to point to him. So if I say Alex for Courtney on direct, he'll respond to me in his direct line and then we'll sit there and talk back and forth. Go ahead, Stuart. Just on frequencies and channels, the, um, the level of radios that you use in broadcast, you can actually get them so that only certain people can use certain channels. So you'll have one that uh, production can be discussed on that mm -hmm the talent can't listen into it, it's yep. deliberate even if they turn to the right channel they get nothing yep, yep right absolutely. it's only those radios for those authorized people yeah go ahead jason and then alex yeah and it also it's worth mentioning that if you're not familiar with this kind of talk and talk back and you know go for alex type thing people will explain it to you and they will they will go into the nth degree of detail if you ask but Ask. But ask, I mean, but really, ask, ask, but, but ask before you get, don't ask on the walkie talkie, you know, like, like, oh, so, yes. Oh yeah. Well that, yes, that's my so, point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, but definitely getting like, and you can search for some of these. And if you have more questions about this and we can have a whole hour on protocol, but, but the, the main thing is in comms protocol, uh, we, one of the things that we, uh, do is we really want to tell people how it is. And, and the best thing to do is listen. If you just listen, you'll hear the protocol happening. And you'll, you'll start to get a sense of what it, you know, what it should do, but listen for a while before you actually say something. And then the other thing is, is that what we try to do as best we can, we learned a lot. If you listen to NASA, we, we did a bunch of events with NASA and I'm pretty sure if the, if the space station was on fire, like literally on fire and astronauts were dying, uh, you know, ast you would hear over comms, uh, space station is on fire space station is on fire. We've lost one astronaut, you know, like, and, and that's the, you know, like, like that's how that, that's how that would sound on, on the comms. And, and the thing is, is that you want to, we really took that on and we try to train people in our group to talk like that on comms where you just, you hear this, this soothing kind of flat, whatever, no matter what's happening. And we had one where we were, we were shooting in Utah and the, um, we started getting a square wave into our, into our UPSs and our UPSs started smoking a lot. And what you heard over the walkies was, uh, Marty, uh, we, we have a fire in the truck, fire in the truck, you know, and I, <laughs> and I was like, ah, my, my team. So, uh, you know, so there's not, you know, and, and so, but that's what you want to be thinking about as you do it is slow, pe well-spoken people can hear what you said. They know what you're trying to get to and it's not adding stress to the system. You know, like you're not making people, people have the sense that things are under control, even if they're not but they have it like, you know, you're controlling that. And it's super important for you to get good at that as you work on it. Great teams that do this will be this calm, you know, uh, you know, and then the, the key is also to keep the extraneous information off the producers make a lot of decisions about uh, teams based on what the chatter on their comms, you know, you just need to know that you're being judged you know, by that uh, uh, grant and then bill and then Paul. And then, oh, I'm sorry, Alex. Alex is next. Now Alex first and then, and then Grant. And just from the point of view of a member of a crew, um, what happens is that the, the walkies are the first off the track because they have to set it up first because we have to do the get-in. Mm -hmm. And then you're given half a day to go to the walkie kind of room and they give you your walkie-talkie and they give you a laminate for the directs and then also the laminate also has the groups. And you just have your laminate. You get to know it. You know which one to switch to. And then that becomes the thing that you have with you. And then you have to go back every day or two to recharge your Motorola battery. And then sometimes you hear on comms, bring your, make sure your battery is okay. So different people have to know different amounts of this. As just a normal member of the crew, you just have to know a little bit. And also when you get your radio, that's the time to ask the questions to the person in the radio shack. Because those are the people who, who can tell you what you need to know. Yeah, go ahead, Grant, and then Bill, and then Paul. Yeah, I was just going to talk about the difference between simplex and, and duplex or full duplex um, because it, it actually affects the way that you um, communicate on comms. So um, when you're used to full duplexes in both ways and you can talk over each other when you're on a typical party line like a, you know, um, uh, the, um, oh, the, uh, the, the, like the typical here. belt packs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, the belt packs. Um, I think some people who are always used to that 
probably chatter more because people can cut them off and people can jump in. Whereas when you're in simplex, often well, like with walkie talkies, um, when you get used to that, you're, you're thinking about getting in and out as quickly as possible because you're taking up that whole channel during that time. And so the, the more, the more that people get to play in simplex world, the better they are when they come to a full party line in full duplex. Right. That's great. Bill. Yeah, and I was trained in the old walkie-talkie days where it took a, uh, like a half a second for the carrier wave to establish between the two walkie-talkies. And that's why I think in the early days of pilots and things like that, you often hear, ah, uh, I don't want to call the, you know, ah, uh, give me channel two or something like that. Almost that ah uh, allowed the carrier wave to establish a signal between the two. Because if you just dive in and start talking fast to people on the walkie-talkie, you can lose the first two words, maybe three words. Good, Paul. Paul, Paul? Yeah, just a couple pointers on, you, you had mentioned the bow. Oh, you're, you're just muted, Bill. Paul, whatever happened there, you muted. You were doing so well. Your mic just disappeared. Your mic, you tapped your mic and then it, it died. Good word. All right, Courtney? Uh, yeah, getting uh, a couple of things, getting back to Alex's uh, point of the calmness, uh, the opening scene in Close, en I think it's Close Encounters, they hired real air traffic controllers to do that dialogue where they see the UFO and they go, would you like to report a UFO? And the guy goes, no, I uh, don't think I would like to do that. <laughs> <It's> very <laughs> calm. <laughs> and they're seeing something out of this world, but they're all very calm and collected. Well, and, and that was, you used to be able to listen. If you can actually download ATC. I think it's called ATC. It's a, air, you can download air an app. control. And, and you can listen to air traffic control from all over the world. And, uh, and you just tune into their air traffic controls. It's kind of fun to listen to. Um, but it, but it, it, you do, there's a professionalism that comes with good comm etiquette and good comm speaking habits that people will remember you know, when you, when you're on a crew. Um, go ahead, Sky. The, the other, well, the oh, other ahead, point I wanted to make was, was, in a walkie-talkie system, in an RF system, you got to remember: if you key your mic, nobody else can talk at that time right. on the channel. So, uh, don't have a latching uh, microphone button, or if you do, make be sure you're not keyed. And you'll oftentimes people people will get upset where you'll hear this like get you know someone's got an open mic you know and, and it's always like somebody you hear rustling papers and everything else that someone's left it. that happens in comms all the time. So also be very. I'm always. I have a nervous habit of looking at my panel all the time to make sure that I don't see any, anything on, you know, I just, you know, cause it's just easy when you're in the middle of production to leave something open. And we've had people lose their job over that. You know, they, they leave it open and then they say things on an open comm channel that they shouldn't have said. Go ahead, Sky. Well, I'm just thinking of some of these recent space movies too and how emotional they are, but that makes for good drama. Yep. But as your point in the real world, and as Courtney just pointed out, they hired the, calm voices yeah. for your purpose but it just doesn't make for good film or tv yeah. but it makes good film and, and tv yeah i'm I not have, saying that everyone's calm like you get onto ones especially directors oh gosh they go crazy uh go ahead guy go ahead quick and then we'll go back to calm go ahead audio now fast it's what, amazing what? how fast people can get it turning off those open mics uh, i used to shoot a lot of rock concerts and when that bleed comes in from the pa through everybody's ears somebody just i mean it's amazing <laughs> I, I watch these guys just close that mic yeah bam yeah. Am I back? Am I back now? Okay, great. Okay. Bao Feng, she mentioned the Bao Feng. Uh, it's a great radio. It's the butt of many jokes in the ham radio community, but it's very frequency agile. You can go on any frequency. It has UHF and VHF. And, and if you want to program it, it's way easier to program it if you get an open source programming software like Chirp, C H I R P, is great. It's free but a better one is RT systems. And then you can program multiple channels into your Baofeng. And in, the, another thing you can do is uh -oh. your phone. You got a connection issue, Paul. That sounded like Wi-Fi went bad on him. All right, we're going to go to the next Baofeng stood for about... Paul, you're falling apart. dollars you can buy a kit. Yep. We, we, you're falling apart. We're gonna have to. We're gonna move on. Okay. Next question. We're gonna, we're running into running out of time. Next question. Okay. James Babbitt of San Diego is answered. We're moving on to Beju in India. Uh, any suggestions on ways to get multiple PLs connected to local comms without having to bring in the Unity server on site? Yeah. Go ahead, Grant. 
um, m- multiple clients plugged in and bringing them in. I mean, it's so it it really does work. Um, there's something that I I do in here is I have one iPad that's just dedicated to listening to one channel, and I use that as my as my producer into the stage um, in Zoom. And the reason I do that is that anything that I send from here is mix minus, you know, nothing, nothing, it's not going to program. So I, I can talk to the talent in the stage, but because I have a dedicated channel in unity, um, now anybody who speaks and we have only got a handful of people have access to that channel in unity. Um, when they speak in that channel, it goes out of that iPad and in, into that zoom call, um, and doesn't go to program. And so it's just another way of doing it. So there's no reason why you can't have multiple devices that are just listening to one channel. Um, and then also if you're doing bi-directional, um, you know, transmitting as well. Yeah. The reason I asked about this was like, we, when we had a recent event, we bought the server on site to our main MCR, but at other locations, we were basically, we had everybody on phones on our laptops. We did do what Grant suggested for one of the devices for a backup audio chain. We had actually had backup audio going over 4G, running from site to site as well as a backup in case our main connections went down. So looking, is there a better option than just having to have four or six different devices for each party line on Vox or other other option I could think of was Unity Connect, but it is a bit more complex and expensive. Well, and I don't know if you, we got emails yesterday that said they're closing Unity Connect in February. Ah, ouch. And I have no, like, it was kind of out of the blue, but there's, and I don't know whether it was, there's emails that have gone out to some, to Unity Connect owners that say they're end of life in it. And they, I don't like the craziest thing I saw, I, I you know, and so I didn't get the email. I got someone else who was like, what's going on? Cause it's, you know, it's a big chunk of stuff and it seemed like it was doing well. So we should do some more research. We'll come back and talk to you about that because it kind of terrified me because I built a bunch of stuff on it. Um, Jason? I would say uh, Dante and Oxens would do it. That's that's an easy alternative. I mean, one of the things that we're doing for one facility that we're working on is a Dante pipeline using the Studio Technologies uh, belt packs and then tying that into Unity to, you know, to for external people to be able to interact with us, you know, and so it so it's kind of a mixed mix and match, you know, kind of, kind of set up, you know, to make that work. Next question. Moving to a Mitchell's in Washington, who asks, has anyone else used WebEx in audio only mode as an intercom system for mobile devices and laptops? Uh, we used to use GoToMeeting. That was like kind of in our pre clearcom stage was that we would use GoToMeeting for our back channel, you know, for everything, which I think would probably be similar to WebEx, you could also use Discord or you could use a phone call. And I, mean, I don't, you know, there's a lot of, the nice thing about it is, is that, you know, it's in it, WebEx is essentially just giving you a phone bridge. So you could use uh, freeconferencecall.com, Uber conferencing. Uh, once you get into that, I don't know if you would get that much more out of it. Go ahead, Stuart. Just going back to the previous question, Mickey's put a comment in the chat. It's a different company called Unity Connect that is shutting down. So it's not it's not Unity Connect that we know of. It's a different company called Unity Connect. Uh, this is maybe maybe there's a licensing issue. All right. Yeah, maybe there's that's a reason. That's why we use down. trademarks. Oh. Uh, okay. All right. So good good thanks Mickey because I was we got these emails and we were like what is going on? Uh, that's a lot of con- Unity probably should get out there in front of that because there's a whole bunch of us trying to figure out what happened at, starting yesterday afternoon and there was a lot of um a lot of discussions about it. So next question. Uh, moving on to Robert Laney in Las Vegas, who says, would it be possible for all the panelists to call out quickly what their preferred comm solution is for virtual events? I think we have a lot of Unity users here. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. My, mine is the one that doesn't exist right now. Um, I think I, I've used a bunch of different ones and they all they all do something really well and they all fail to do something that the other one does. And I, I think there's opportunity for, for whatever the next generation is. That, I think that, that, I mean, for, for me, the only limit to ClearCom is price. Like, you know, price is, you know, to build a full ClearCom system to the level that we use it, retail is probably 60 to $80,000. There's nothing it can't do. Like, like, you know, like if I'm going to build a, if I was, if someone said, I'm going to give you money to build out your, your system, um, 
the, the level, of it, there's no scale limit, you know, to it. And I can do hardware. Like, so we're, we've been talking about little, little events and <laughs> little things, even with hundreds of people with ClearCom, I can trunk two full um, systems to each other, 3000 miles apart or 8,000 miles apart and tie those all together. There's a whole scale of, of things that I can do with ClearCom that I can't do with anything else. And then I have all the hardware and then I have all the interact, you know, in all the, you know, cards and free speak, and there's a whole scale to it. So if you said, what is your favorite? I would say, I think ClearCom is by far the best um, uh, fully operational solution. The problem with it is it's expensive, you know, like to get into it. It's not as expensive as, as Riedel, but it's probably, you know, to get into that and to keep on adding those cards, it costs real money. But I will say that it's by far the best one. Um, then I would say that cost effectively, I think Unity. Go ahead, Bill, and then Grant. Yeah, I bought an old used ClearCom system and used it for about a decade. And the thing that I loved about it, it was engineered so well because if you were in a very quiet play and you had to whisper mm -hmm. and nobody, you know, every, all camera operators had to be able to hear every whisper clearly, it worked. And if you got into a mosh pit at a ska concert and it was insanely loud and you had double muff uh, ClearCom sets, you could still hear every bit of the comm channel. So it really scaled beautifully with their engineering to just work. But I, I do think Unity's taken incredible ground as far as ease of use and, and, and scale and, and cloud and you know, a lot of other things that are, that are done. So I'm, I'm, I don't wanna undermine, I think that there's a lot of great uses for it, but if you're asking me what my favorite is, that's gonna be what I'm gonna say. Go ahead, Grant, and then Stuart. Yeah, I've used Agent IC and it's awesome as well. So, but um, I, I do I do just use Unity, but I'd also just mention too that what I do is, particularly on you're asking about virtual events, um, I've talked in length about using breakout rooms for different things for the stage. And one of those rooms is a green room for um, event staff. And so it's essentially a party line because um, now I don't need to give the client, uh, any of the clients, um, uh, access to Unity. I just have them sitting in a breakout room. I pipe in um, a multi-view of the production switcher so they can see everything happening and they hear program audio at a lower level, but they can hear it and they can comfortably talk over the top. So whenever we want to access the client, we can just jump into that breakout room. We have it set up on a dedicated machine. We can quickly talk to them. And then it's only our key production staff that we have in Unity. Um, so it's just a way of just pushing them all off into a whole separate space. And they're very happy. They can contact us easily. It works well. Yeah, the, we, we do that a lot as well. It's a, good, it's a great way to do it. We just have all the producers jump into a, and that can be anything. It can be a, a, a Zoom call, um, a, a Skype call, uh, whatever it is. They have one. And for us, because we're doing point to points, that's just one of our computers. And they're seeing, uh, to your point, a multi-view that, that is what all the things that are going on that they need to see. The place where we start adding them back into, for us, ClearCom, but it could be Unity, is when we want to create talk back between the producing staff and the talent. So we want them to be able to, on their phone, be able to talk to the talent during the show and, and be able to interact with them. And that's where having a better, a more dedicated pipeline becomes uh, more important. Um, my, cheap, my, my cheap way about that is because it's the same meeting, I can, don't, drag, don't room. People, I can oh, yeah. drag them in. And they, if they have their camera turned off, they can actually sneak into the stage. Right. Um, and, you know, and so it's, a, it's another way. And then they can type and they can do all sorts. Right, right. Go ahead, Stuart, uh, real quick. Two things. First one is it's real easy to imagine Bill at a SCAR gig. Okay. <laughs> but for, for those of us who are IP based, I would love to see if somebody would develop a, a simple NDI based uh, like app for phones that we could use to send comms back and forward uh, on our own Wi-Fi or in, like network. Right. like completely separate to everything else it's like there's an opportunity there so if anyone's a developer who can do apps on phones for android and pc or not android PC, android and iphone go for it i'm sure you'll find plenty of people i think that the challenge really is, is that unity has taken up an enormous amount of the oxygen when it comes to ip based phone based you know if you're not using that it's that if i was doing market analysis i'd be like wow that's a really that's a stiff hill <laughs> to, to, to climb now. I think that they've gotten so far out ahead of that kind of lower cost, uh, you know, highly scalable, you know, solution. I think that that, that would be a hard one to, um, to get through. Um, next question. We're going to go. Russo, 
says, what is the panel's thoughts on using personal devices as production intercom? Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Brett. Well, I was just going to say as a tech manager, this is a very stressful point that Chris brings up because, uh, you know, we are now talking about mission critical infrastructure that is being provided by the client. Uh, and so between battery and earbuds, headsets, and overall functionality, Wi-Fi, the audio buffer on Unity, all of these risks, uh, you know, really do require the attention of a full-time comms A2 to, to, to get it dialed in. And so uh, I just, we kind of wanted to hear everyone's thoughts on that because, you know, the, you're asking the client to pay for intercom, but we're also putting the burden of it working on, on the end user. And, and all of those, I mean, the thing to know with, with whether it's Unity or, or Clearcom, all of them, because of just the nature of a lot of these uh, handsets, they're going to lose connection. And it's, they're not going to know that they lost connection. That is going to happen on Agent IC. It's going to happen on Unity. It's going to happen on, you know, there are connection issues with iOS devices and Android devices. And it's just the protocol, way the protocols work and everything else. And so it is, a, it is a challenge. But, you know, I think you have that challenge with almost any uh, consumer device being used as a comm system is, is, is you're, you know, you're pulling a big trailer with a Chevette. Um, go ahead, uh, George and Courtney, and then Stuart. So we've definitely gotten um, on show side pushback from camera operators on using their own personal devices for uni unity comm. So pretty much uh company is going to have a look at buying their own iOS and devices on Android devices. Yeah, and iPod touches will work just fine for Unity, uh, you know, so you can use those and put them in a little battery pack or give them a battery pack. The one thing to know is that Unity just drives their batteries into the ground, you know, and so you you really need to have external power. The other advantage of having a dedicated piece is that everyone's getting all these texts and they're getting calls, the reason, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And all of those interrupt what they're doing with Unity and so, or, or ClearComm's uh, Agent IC. And so having it on a separate device that not connected to anything else is also useful as far as it really working. Go ahead, Courtney, and then Stuart. Yeah, you just touched on the point I was going to bring up because most personal devices these days have sealed batteries that are not interchangeable. So if their battery goes dead and Unity will drain their batteries uh, in the middle of the show, you know, they can't yeah. plug it in to, to recharge if they're mobile moving around. So it's okay. best to have some a device that has replaceable batteries. When theirs goes dead, you can pop a new one in. Yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Just on the physical interface between the device and the person, when it comes to these sorts of things, everyone should have their own, just because we're in the middle of a pandemic, anything you spit on, well, like your mic, your earphone, make sure you've got your own for your own health and safety. Yep, next question. Moving on to Charles Hedge of White Lake, Michigan. Can someone explain the comm setup used by the NFL and who's talking to whom? I don't know if I don't know I don't know if that's public. Those comm systems are so that typically is I think it's a mixture of an R RTS and I think the trucks are RTS and the and the um, the rest of it's Riedel typically. Uh, I don't know enough about it to be able to do it, but I promise you it's a very complex system. <laughs> it's not just it's not just a you know it's going to be a this very very this is a good example of something that's a huge mixture there's the audio team there's the audio team that only manages the the calls there's a there is a audio you know there's mul there's multiple cameras that are on the set this is these are the kinds of examples where there's probably 24 to 48 channels of different things going on um, at any given point in time to to communicate those most of the trucks are RTS so that's my guess there but um, usually the the stuff on, on, on site is most of it's wired, you know, except for what's on the field, just because you wanted to make sure it works. Courtney and then Jason. Yeah, I was wondering if they were talking mainly about the uh, team to spotter and the press box oh. communications, which Motorola usually buys out and furnishes. Um, and that's private line encrypted channels so that the, the opposing team can't monitor them. And that's Unless separate the from regular is. comms. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you just had to dig of the North or AFC Northwest. We always dig in the Patriots. You never know what, what's what's gonna happen with your comms. Anyway, Jason. Uh yeah, I I just I have to point out that that is quite possibly the most complicated live comm system that that is in regular use in this country, period. Uh, I, Short uh, of the uh, Olympics, maybe. Uh, uh yeah. Publicly. I mean like non you know, like for uh, yeah. Anyway, next question. Wouldn't NASCAR rival that, Jason? Probably. 
Yeah, probably. The difference is NAS. Well, no, actually, NASCAR tracks because it's in a different city every every week, right? So yeah, that makes sense. Alex Next can't question. say it, but think military. Next question. There you go. Moving on. James in Dublin says, uh, using comms, uh, oh, using audio mix feature in Memo Live to send comms to a remote caller. The caller needs to be free to move around. What would you suggest? The budget starts at zero dollars, and every dollar counts. And has a note: Would the Bluetooth headset work, or should I use an existing Rode Go to send audio from the host laptop to wired in-ear headphones? Everything you wire will work better. <laughs> just do, you mean like especially with comms, you just need to know everything that you put on a wire is going to work better than than something wireless. Uh, you know, so I think that that's the thing that I would, you know, and, you know, I actually find Bluetooth more stable than Wi-Fi. So if you're going to do something with it, you know, having Bluetooth in, in good proximity is, is more stable than, than using a Wi-Fi connection. Especially the latest Bluetooth. They've improved a lot. 5.0, I find to be a lot more stable. Yeah. Um, but you know, I always look for where ways that you can wire it. If it, if you really can't, then you go to wireless and RF is going to be better than Bluetooth and typically in a short distance, better than Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi. Um, but, but it depends on where you're at and what, are, what else is going around, you know, but, but the, uh, oftentimes it'll be better. Wi-Fi is really difficult. You know, like it's just not built for what we're asking it to do. It's not built for, you know, pack, you know, no packet, zero packet loss is, is part of the problem. Um, next question. And we've made it to the last one in today's list. Brody Hafner of New York City gets the nod for this. Could Courtney briefly describe his early innovations in development of onset comms and the extent to which those innovations influence what's in use today? Courtney? Well, I don't know what kind of innovations are talking about. I did, uh, in the early, early days, in the analog days, uh, devised uh, monitor talkback systems that worked with the Nagra. So it had private line talkback to the boom person and um, uh, the ability to, to slate and, you know, so you have a one button goes to the PL to the boom person, the other button goes to the tape and rolls the Nagra. And I built all that and also did tail tone generation back when things were transferred to film. They would generate tones at the end of each, uh, uh, you know, at the end of each take when you turn off the Nagra would put two beep tones onto the tape. And those kind of innovations were built into, I uh, sold that design to Perfect Tone or a couple other, couple other mixing that built in remote controls into their mix panels. But uh, I haven't really been involved in comms much since the analog days. So I I don't claim any credit or any, <laughs> anything like that in, in the, the existing state of communications. And a lot of the, the stuff that you're talking about has been incorporated now. I mean, a lot of, if you work in a, uh, you know, with, with a sound device is one of the larger sound devices, you'll see there's all kinds of comms that are built into the actual uh, device so, you can, so that the A1 can talk to the A2 and, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a self-contained system. Anyway, hopefully that was a good discussion for everyone. We answered a lot of questions. Uh, we got through a lot. Uh, hopefully that starts to get people's head around the beginning of it. I, there, we could talk about this all day. We could talk about this all week. I mean, there's just so much to comms, but we're going to try to bring some folks in to talk about comms directly in the, in the coming months. And I wanted to kind of start to get through some of those discussions before we, I, what I'm trying to do is kind of prep the ground where we've all thought about it a little bit before we, uh, so we have a little bit more to, more to say when we bring some specialists in to, to talk about it. Anyway, thank, thanks to everyone. As always, it is, uh, it is great to see all of you. Um, and and uh, even the ones that hang out past the end of the hour. Uh, and um, so, um, so anyway, so thanks, thanks to everyone. And tomorrow, as a reminder, we'll be talking about education. Uh, so education will be second hour. It's the one time we do let the educators come in uh, in the middle. Uh, so, um, so we'll start at the normal time and then we'll uh, uh, start uh, education at eight o'clock. And then of course, Sunday is just wide open. So thanks to everyone and have a great day, or great morning, great evening, all those things. And we'll see you tomorrow.